listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. Armor Tough interlocking floor tiles are the best choice to replace newer aging, stained, cracked concrete, or epoxy floors, and here's why. Armor Tough Tiles comes with a lifetime, yes, you heard that correctly, lifetime warranty and are usually installed in just one or two days, depending on the size of your station, with virtually no disruption in the operation of your station. Armor Tough interlocking tiles are guaranteed from the following, chipping, cracking, peeling, breaking, or staining. And once installed, the tiles are non-skid and non-slip. And they also meet the ADA standards for the friction coefficient, which you always love. The tiles are stain resistant and impervious to any chemicals or volatiles that we commonly see used in the fire service. And once installed, you can clean your floor the standard way, the old school way, with just soap and water. Install an armor tough tile in your apparatus bays, your offices, training rooms, workshops, exercise rooms, kitchens, banquet halls, or any other room. Yes, any other room in your station. Call Vince today for a no obligation quote at 908-917-7697. Why install a breakable epoxy floor that you're going to have to replace in 5 to 10 years when you could have a floor that will last a lifetime? Drop a halogen in an armor tough floor, you won't see any damage to it. However, you can't say the same about concrete or, of course, epoxy too. Join the hundreds, yes, hundreds of career and volunteer fire departments nationwide who have chosen an armor tough interlocking tile floor. Armor Tough interlocking tiles are half the price of epoxy and will last a lifetime without issue. Again, call Vince today for a no obligation. Yes, you heard that correctly. No obligation quote at 908 917 7697. The Squad. It's defined as a small group of people or soldiers having a particular task or set of tasks. Squadron marched into 16th century English as a word for a body of soldiers arranged in a square formation, at the time a sound warfare strategy. But it was quickly adapted as a word for any shaped small military unit, or numbered for that matter, the larger the better. Military squadrons also took to the sea in the 16th century and in the air in the 20th. The term flying squadron as well as flying squad applies to both readied or deployed naval and military forces. A flying squadron, or flying squad, might also be a small standby group, like a police squad, ready to move or act swiftly when called upon. So just when did the FDNY feel the need to create their own squad companies? To answer that, we need to go back all the way to World War I. At various times throughout the history of the New York City Fire Department, Squad companies have been established to provide specific functions, usually to offset manpower issues. For roughly a year during World War I, from 1918 to 1919, the Flying Squadron, as it was known, operated from the quarters of Engine 40. The unit was assigned a converted 1915 Mack hose wagon and was driven by a regular firefighter. It was staffed by as many as 30 members of the Auxiliary Corps and assigned to respond on second alarms throughout Manhattan and on third alarms in the Bronx. Its purpose was to provide additional manpower at incidents that were major and to alleviate the critical manpower shortage caused by the war. World War II again brought about manpower shortages, with many firefighters serving in the armed forces. To cope with this situation, three squad companies were established. Squad 21 was organized at the quarters of Ladder 24, then located at 114 West 33rd Street. Engine 20, then located at 243 Lafayette Street, was reorganized as Squad 22, and Engine 204 at 299 DeGraw Street was reorganized as Squad 24. Although slated to be organized, Squad 23 was never established. Staffing on these squads consisted of an officer and 10 firefighters per tour. Their primary purpose was to finish additional manpower to control fire, and they carried only hand tools. They were not used for overhauling and were returned to service as rapidly as possible, to be available for the next fire. Each was assigned a 1930 Seagrave hose wagon that had been converted into a personnel carrier by the addition of bench seats in those hose beds. On May 16, 1945, Squad 21 was disbanded 
and squads 22 and 24 reverted to their pre-war status as engines 20 and 204, as the manpower shortage eased with the return of the World War II veterans. Their apparatus were reconfigured as standard hose wagons again and returned to their original assignments. The order, organizing the New York Auxiliary Squad Sendee of 1943, stated the function as, The primary purpose of the squad companies will be to furnish added manpower whenever conditions at a fire or other emergency warrant, such as for stretching and operating additional hose lines, assisting on hose lines, replenishing manpower affected at fires, for raising ladders, or for conditions where the need for additional men is imperative. Members of the squad companies shall not be detained at a fire or other emergency longer than necessary in fulfilling the purposes above mentioned. They shall not be held for overhauling operations after a fire is under control. One of the first projects undertaken by Commissioner Edward F. Cavanaugh Jr. on assuming management of FDNY in February 1954 was a study of heavily populated sections of the city where living and housing conditions caused a high incidence of fires and life loss, and often resulted in critical situations of a shortage of apparatus companies because of numerous simultaneous fires and fire emergencies. Throughout the history of the FDMY, the squads were organized and then disbanded over the course of many decades. The department decided to create highly mobile units capable of moving quickly into any area where critical temporary shortage of units existed to provide coverage of incidents where the response of regularly assigned units was delayed or inadequate. These units were established in high fire incidence areas that contained primary high occupant load tenements. During 1955, this time utilizing converted 1940 Mack hose wagons, the department organized Squad 1 at Engine 59, 180 West 137th Street in Harlem, Squad 2 at Engine 73, 659 Prospect Avenue in the South Bronx, Squad 3 at Engine 235, 206 Monroe Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Squad 4 at Engine 231, 107 Watkins Street in Brownsville. On January 1st, 1956, Squad 4 was relocated to 214 Bristol Street at the quarters of Engine Company 283. Starting in 1957, enclosed delivery van style apparatus were purchased to replace the hose wagons. International trucks delivered four metro vans that had deal bodies and had very unusual seating arrangement. Each firefighter had his own forward-facing seat mounted one behind the other in a row along the left wall within the body of the van. Over the next few years, five additional squads were organized. Squad 5 was established on April 1, 1959, at the quarters of Engine 5 at 340 East 14th Street. Squad 3's recently replaced 1949 hose wagon was assigned to this unit. Squad 6 was organized on November 1, 1959, at the quarters of Engine Company 74 at 205 West 77th Street. Squad 7 followed on December 12th at the quarters of Engine 212, 136 White Street. Two additional 1940 Mack hose wagons were converted for these units. Engine 56 was disbanded on May 1st, 1960, and Squad 6 was relocated to their former quarters at 120 West 83rd Street. On the same day, Rescue 1 moved uptown to Engine 65's quarters, and Squad 8 was established at their former quarters at 243 Lafayette Street. This is the same firehouse that Squad 22 operated from during World War II. Another 1940 Mack hose wagon was converted for Squad 8. A new international metro van was delivered and assigned to Squad 5 during 1961. Squad 9 was organized on June 17, 1961 at the quarters of Engine 22 at 159 East 85th Street. Squad 5's former 1940 Mack converted hose wagon was given to Squad 9. This brings a total number of squads for the department to 9. 9 highly mobile units to offset manpower in areas of high fire loads. These squad companies existed in a time period before engine and ladder companies had minimum staffing levels and manpower was balanced between units. It was not uncommon to have units responding with less than adequate personnel, thereby making this dangerous occupation that much more deadly. 
The original purpose of these squads was to supplement understaffed units responding on the initial alarm. Consequently, each squad had rather large first alarm response districts. They were utilized at whatever task was needed to be performed, assisted in stretching line and operating initial hose lines, ventilation, or assisting with the primary search. Generally, if the fire escalated beyond the initial alarm assignment, the squad company would take up and go back into service when the second alarm companies arrived to the scene, theoretically providing sufficient manpower to handle the fire. Only masks and hand tools were carried by the squads at this period in time. Squad 8 was relocated to quarters of Engine 31 at 87 Lafayette Street on November 1st, 1961. During 1962, four international metro vans were delivered and assigned to Squad 6, 7, 8, 9. Squad 1 moved to new quarters with Engine 59 and Ladder 30 at 111 West 133rd Street on November 1st, 1962. Shortly after this move, Squad 1 was issued a 1963 Metro van. Squad 7 moved to the quarters of Engine 237 at 43 Morgan Ave on July 15, 1964. During February of 1965, Squad 8 moved to Engine 55 at 363 Broom Street and two months later returned to 87 Lafayette Street. One of the oddest squad rigs was a Chevrolet Stageway coach, stretched airport limo, and was purchased and assigned to Squad 3 in 1966. On April 22, 1966, Squad 8 was disbanded and Squad 5 relocated to Engine 17 at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge, 185 Broom Street. America had a world-class fire problem from the late 1960s and well into the 1970s. The fires were fueled by the nexus of societal breakdown, entrenched poverty, crime, an economic crisis, the OPEC oil embargo, urban decline, suburbanization, and technological change. These forces played out in race riots, military draft protests, and violent anti-war protests over our involvement in Vietnam. Our fire problem largely fueled by arson for profit schemes resulted in this part of our history being dubbed the war years, particularly by those who experienced it firsthand. Firefighters and police officers of that era faced the brunt of societal unrest and urban decline on their own type of battlefield. As the department entered what became known as the war years, it became an everyday occurrence in busy areas not to have sufficient engine companies available. As a pilot program on July 1st, 1966, Squad 4 was issued a standard 1963 Mac 1000 GPM pumper. On July 8th, 1966, Squad 7 was disbanded to organize Engine 232 and Squad 3 relocated to the quarters of Engine 230 at 701 Park Avenue. The experiment with Squad 4 being assigned a pumper proved to be very successful and on July 1st, 1967, was assigned a 1960 Ward LaFrance 1000 GPM pumper. On the same day, Squad 9 was disbanded to organize Engine 85. During 1968, Squad 1 and 5 received reassigned 1959 Mac 1000 GPM pumpers. On May 15th, Squad 5 moved out of quarters of Engine 15 at 269 Henry Street. During October 1969, Squad 3 was assigned a 1958 Mac 1000 GPM pumper, and Squad 6 received a 1963 Mac 1000 GPM pumper. A 1952 Ward LaFrance 750 GPM pumper later replaced the 1960 Ward LaFrance pumper at Squad 2. Assigning the pumpers to the remaining squads in effect gave the department six extra engine companies that could be deployed as needed. With the squad companies now arriving at the scene with their fully equipped pumper, often before the assigned engine companies, their function began to change and their mission redefined. On January 10, 1970, Squad 5 moved to the recently vacated quarters of Engine 9 at 55 East Broadway. All six squads were assigned new Mac 1000 GPM pumpers. The areas where the squads were located 
had all become extremely busy with fire duty. On August 21, 1972, the squads were relieved from responding on initial first alarm assignments and were given larger geographic areas to respond to on working fires. During the last year that the squads responded on first alarm assignments, Squad 4 had accumulated over 11,000 responses. In addition to their working fire responses, the squads were utilized during certain hours to respond as the first sections of busy engine companies, freeing those units to respond to subsequent alarms. Squad 1 relocated to the quarters of Ladder 58 at 451 East 176th Street on November 22, 1972. Two days later, Squad 6 was disbanded to establish Ladder 59. Squad 4 moved to new quarters with Engine 283 at 885 Howard Avenue on November 19, 1973. January 1975, Squad 5 was disbanded to organize Engine 66. At the same time, the second section of Engine 41 assigned the 1972 Mac 1000 GPM pumper and located at 330 East 150th Street was redesignated Squad 5. Squad 2 received a reassigned 1972 Mac 1000 GPM pumper during December 1964. As the financial crisis hit, the squads were also used to relocate into an engine company that had less than its minimum manning reporting for duty. That engine would be placed out of service for the tour, and its remaining manpower would be detailed to other units to keep them in service. During 1975, Squads 1 and 4 were assigned new Mac 1000 GPM bumpers. Unfortunately, the squads did not survive the severe budget cuts during the financial crisis. Squads 3, 4, and 5 were closed on July 2, 1975 with squads 4 and 5 being reorganized two days later. Squad 3 was re-established on July 19th. Squad 1 moved to the quarters of Engine 45 at 929 East Tremont Avenue on November 3rd, 1975. As the financial crisis worsened, all five remaining squads were disbanded on May 1st, 1976, which coincidentally was the busiest year in the history of the FDNY. When it appeared that the book had been closed on the squads, Squad 1 was reorganized on December 3, 1977 in the former quarters of Engine 269, 786 Union Street, which had been closed during the budget crisis. The local community had placed great pressure on the city to reopen Engine 269, and the compromise was struck, establishing Squad 1. Squad 1 was assigned a 1969 Mac R Model 1000 GPM pumper, engine company equipment, ladder company hand and power tools, and a high expansion foam generator. The responses included all the former first two boxes of engine 269 and 1075 signals within designated areas. A similar situation arose when engine 41 was reorganized at 330 East 150th Street. On July 1, 1990, this unit was equipped, operated, and responded in a similar manner to Squad 1, but due to political and community considerations, was designated as an enhanced engine company. Engine 41 operated with a 1981 Mac 1000 GPM pumper until receiving a reassigned 1989 pumper in 1993. In an email shared with us by Jack Kleehouse, he spoke about the early organization of Squad 41, then referred to as Enhanced Engine 41. When Engine 41 was closed in 1989, there was strong community opposition. However, when the firehouse was to be reopened in 1990 as a squad, there also was opposition from the community that they did not want the unit there to be anything other than an engine, just like the original 41. The city wanted to get more from the investment and have a special unit responding to the lower portion of the Bronx as well as Harlem, but the community did not want their unit leaving the general area, and they were very forceful in expressing this, so the job decided to name it an enhanced engine. We tried to have it named Squad 2, which was in succession to Squad 1, already organized, 
The job said no. We then tried to have it named Squad 5, which had been in that firehouse years before. They still said no, as they were afraid that the community who already was freaking out when they saw the amount of tools and equipment being readied for the reopening for 7 one and realized that it was more than a local engine. Back then, we were told to use the designation Engine 41 on the department radio, but to use Squad 41 on the HT at operations. The activists had so much power that they forced us to get back the green 81 Mac that had been 41's rig on closing and had then floated around the city as a spare. The job wanted to give us the 87 Mac with more compartments that was at chauffeur training. But the community insisted on the green rig and the job caved and we opened with a nine year old rig with boxes bolted all over. It took until 1998 for the job to stand up and rename it publicly. In recent years, the department has been faced with new missions and functions. In addition to routine hazardous materials incidents, collapse, and confined space operations, the department has been charged by mayoral directive with the mitigation of chemical or biological agents and decontamination of people affected in a terrorist attack. To perform this function, it is necessary to have strategically located units that are properly trained and equipped. For these reasons, five additional engine companies, Engine 18 Manhattan, Engine 61 The Bronx, Engine 252 Brooklyn, Engine 270 Queens, Engine 288 Queens, were selected and designated as squad on July 1st, 1998. The squads are located strategically throughout the city. Squad 18 covers the battery to the Upper East Side and West Sides. Squad 41 covers North Manhattan and the South Bronx, while Squad 61 covers the North Bronx. Squads 270 and 288 split the Borough of Queens, with a similar setup for Squads 1 and 252 in Brooklyn. In Staten Island, Rescue 5 has the additional duties as a hazardous materials technician unit. Effective July 1st, 1998, Engines 18, 61, 252, 270, and 288 are designated as squad companies. They are assigned to the Special Operations Command. All administrative paperwork will be forwarded to the Special Operations Command. The squads are equipped with ladder company tools and are trained and equipped to operate either as a ladder company or engine company. They will continue to respond to their assigned first alarm boxes. In addition, they will respond to 1075s and multiple alarms as per alarm assignments from the Bureau of Communications. These units will operate utilizing the Team Concept Mode, Paragraph 1 of AUC 275, Addendum 1, dated November 15, 1997. Identifying company terminology will be used for squad team positions. Effective August 1, 1998, they also will be hazmat technician units equipped with a second apparatus and equipment for responses to hazmat incidents. Additional information will be published on a future department order. Chief officers shall be cognizant of the versatility and enhanced capability of these units. They shall utilize them whenever operationally indicated, not only as engine companies, but also for any other functions for which they are trained and equipped. The Commissioner's message in the April 1998 issue of Fireworks highlights many of the reasons why these new squads will be so important to our department. Responding to incidents of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Finding ways of improving our response to routine hazardous materials incidents. Upgrading our training and equipment to meet new guidelines and regulations required by OSHA and NFPA. Assuring that we are doing everything possible to fulfill our mission and improve safety for all of our members. If and when New York City is ever subjected to a chemical or biological terrorist attack, FDNY would be the agency responsible for the rescue, mitigation of the hazardous materials, and decontamination of those affected. To do this job, we need properly trained and equipped, strategically located units capable of reaching the scene quickly and initiating whatever actions are necessary to save lives and assist both civilians and other emergency responders. 
Quick response by highly trained personnel is the key to successful operations. Enhanced Engine Company 41 was designated a squad company on July 1, 1998, along with five new squads in Squad 1, giving the department a total of seven squad companies. Squad 18 and 61 operated a 1988 Mac 1000 GPM pumper. Squad 288 operated a 1998 Mac 1000 GPM pumper, and Squad 270 operated a 1996 Seagrave pumper, and Squad 252 operated a 1997 Seagrave pumper. All of these pumpers were extensively modified with the addition of extra equipment boxes and compartments to carry the vast assortment of assigned tools. These units receive intensive training in ladder company operations, collapse, confined space, high angle, and other rescue operations. In addition, they receive extensive hazmat mitigation and decontamination training. The new squads continue to respond to their first alarm boxes. And in addition, each squad is assigned a large 1075 working fire response area. In addition to standard engine and ladder company equipment, each squad is assigned airbags, cutting torch, exothermic torch, chain and partner saws, hydraulic tools, thermal imaging cameras, generators, sawzall, wizard saw, multi-gas detection meters, paratech air gun, cribbing, a hearse tool system, and a full complement of water rescue equipment. Squad companies 1 and 41 were assigned a custom-built 1998 Seagrave rescue pumper. Five additional Seagrave rescue pumpers were delivered in 2000 and assigned to squad 18, 61, 252, 270, and 288. When the World Trade Center attacks occurred, it destroyed six apparatus belonging to the squad companies. Along with the tools, equipment, and apparatus was the terrible loss of members from squad companies. Squad 1 lost 12. Squad 18 lost 7. Squad 41 lost 6. Squad 252 lost 5. Squad 288 lost 6. A total of 36 squad firefighters and officers were lost on that day. That's about 25% of all the members of the squads combined. It was a devastating blow to the command. The knowledge, training, and experience of all those firefighters wiped away in one single day. There were ideas floating all around the command that they were going to fold up the squads and roll all the members into rescues. That never happened. Instead, the squads and rescues rebuilt the command. It was a daunting task. Rebuilding the company while going to funerals being a support system for the families of the fallen and spending countless hours at the site digging through the rubble in the hopes of finding members that may have survived. They rebuilt the command, trained up all the new members, and carried on in the proud tradition of the squad companies that spanned over a century. If you're looking for a gift for that special firefighter in your life, then head on over to GetInSaltyApparel.com. Yes, GetInSaltyApparel.com. What do we have? Well, we carry hand-drawn original t-shirts, glassware such as mugs, shot glasses, pint glasses, engraved Arctic cooler cups, and much, much more. There's also a full line of firefighter tool bottle openers like Halligan's, Nozzles, and wine bottle opener accesses too. And if you're a cigar smoker, congratulations! We have partner saw cigar cutters and humidors. Think we're done? Far from it. We got toiletry, gear bags, poozies, a full line of hats, decals, sweatshirts, and once again, so much more. We can also personalize most of these products. And if you want discounts, hey, you've come to the right place. We got discounts on large orders for promotion dinners, weddings, as well as installation dinners. Just head on over to GetInSaltyApparel.com. We sat down with four leaders in the FDNY Special Operations Command to better understand how they carried the squads into the modern era pre and post 9-11. Chief Thomas Richardson. Chief Stephen Rosweiler. Chief Jerry Tracy. And Captain Dennis Murphy.
Yeah, well, we did run in with uh, Squad One, and uh, we knew quite a few guys there. And uh, actually, one of my uh, members was uh, Sterling Alves. He transferred over to Squad One, and um, you know, he, he was uh, really instrumental in talking to the guys in 252 what a good thing this would be for us. Um, so, you know, with him, that was a, a positive thing, and eventually he ended up coming back to 252. Um, other than that, uh, 41, didn't see too much of them, but we did know guys up there, and we knew quite a few guys up in 41, um, and we always heard good things about them and their operation. So, uh, you know, we were looking forward to it. That's good. So my experience with squad and 41 goes way back well before 1998, you know, when I was in a firefighter and rescue too, which goes back to, I was there like 87 through 90. So we ran in with Squad One all the time in Brooklyn, and I uh, knew a lot of the guys there. I knew what the company was about. I knew, you know, it was a special unit. Uh, 41, uh, I never got detailed there as a firefighter. You know, when 41 started, I don't recall exactly when they started, but I remember there was some a bumpy road there. They were an yeah. enhanced engine company right. yeah. before they became a squad company. Then they had that neighborhood trouble too up there. Right? Yes, yeah. they did. You know, it was a whole big to do, right? But I, I do remember getting detailed to Rescue 4, Rescue 3 a few times and running in with 41. And, you know, Jack Kleehouse was a lieutenant there. And I remember going to a few good jobs when I was working in one of those rescue companies and uh, running in with them. But I never was, I wasn't thinking at the time, you know, 98 came, I was where I was. and. I really wasn't thinking about what it would be like to be in a squad, like right, you know, because I never worked in Squad One, never worked in Squad Forty One. Uh, just had my interactions with them when I was a firefighter, getting detailed to the rescues. Mm. My exposure to the squads was nil, to tell you the truth. Uh, I was a firefighter in the hundred nature up. Uh, either our jobs were under control, or it was a multiple alarm. And at a multiple alarm, you're really not interacting with, let's say, firefighters from Squad. Uh, the rescues, you know, uh, we would work with them, rescue too. Uh, often enough, they'd be responding to a box that maybe we would be the next truck on the second alarm. Uh, so we'd run up to Broadway and moon them as they drove past, you know, <laughs> uh, thinking, you know, as a firefighter, we were proud firemen. And we were, to say we, I was privileged to work with some really talented men. And they uh, taught me to, and honed my craft taught me, you know, uh, the tools. And I felt, you know, what are they going to do that we can't do? A good truck uh, type thing. So it wouldn't be until years later when they were forming these five new squads and I was given this gift of being a squad captain that I really uh, learned what special operations was all about. It was an eye opener for me. Yeah. I, had, I had similar experience to, certain, uh, to a certain level. You know, we uh, they didn't do a lot of work in our area. We all worked pretty much in the, in the same area. So, uh, but, you know, the guys used to kid around that the squad was an engine with a roof rope. But, <laughs> and, and they did. It's, they used to say in those days. But, again, you, as you gain more experience, your horizon broadens a little. You know, and I'm not talking about, as like Jerry just said, as a squad officer. But, you know, when we were rescue two, we would go to certain areas that uh, weren't as busy as... Uh, as the areas that we came from and uh, that's when I did see the squad and the rescue at that time make impacts at fires you know like fires that were going south and then that became apparent I think when all of us became officers in the squads you know yeah you're not gonna roll into uh, an area in uh, you know in the areas where we worked and really make an impact most of the time unless something is drastically wrong or it's an expanding operation but you may run into areas where certain basics haven't gotten covered and mm. you pick it up and as my late great friend uh, used to say billy lake uh, we were an impact company at that fire you yeah know? that's a key word yeah man. like impact like yep. right so we made a difference right. that was that was the word yeah right. right so uh, that's that was my experience When I first heard about it is what I saw about it. I saw it on a department order. They were looking for captains. I love it. I saw it on a department order. 
I gave it some thought, like I kind of glanced over the order, and uh, I was in 234 engine at the time. I had been there about three years. I had a couple of new lieutenants. I had five rotation firefighters. And I kind of said, you know what, I'm kind of tight here. Like, you know, I got good bosses. Jake LaMunda was one of my lieutenants. Wow. And uh, I really was enjoying it there. You know, I was going to fires. It was a great firehouse, great area to work. Again, I worked in the area there uh, as a firefighter and as a lieutenant. And then I forget where, where it was, but I happened to run into Joe Downey, Ray Downey's boy, his son, Joe. So now Joe started in the same company I did, 227. But at the time, I guess in 1998, maybe Joe's a lieutenant. I don't remember. But Joe says to me, wherever I saw him, and I don't remember where it was, but he says, hey, have you given any thought to the squads? They're looking for a couple of captains. He says, hey, you'd probably be a great candidate. I said, you know, Joe, I saw it on your order. I didn't really give it any thought. He said, well, my father said he's looking for some guys. Like, you know, he says, you know, give it some thought. So... I was in this building that we're in right now. I was here after a funeral. I was in the main hall here at the collation. It wasn't a firefighter funeral. It was a member of the department wow. and a uh, family member. So I came to the luncheon or whatever afterwards, and my phone rings. And I, I guess I did have a cell phone then. I, I, in 1998, I guess we did. Look. Maybe it was. Star Trek. <clears throat> and who's on the phone is Ray Downey. <clears throat> I swear to God. And he says, uh, hey, Tom, Ray Downey. I says, Chief, what's happening? He says, listen, uh, have you given any thought to being a squad captain? I says, I, I says, I, I told Joe the other day, I saw him in the order, I really haven't given any thought. He says, well, uh, I'm still looking for a couple of captains. He says, I, I got two companies open. He says, uh, what do you think? I says, I see. and I told him the same story I just told you guys. Like, you know, I was a captain 234, I got the lieutenants, and I said, can I? Like, can I think about it? He says, I need an answer by tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. So I go home that day, and I'm talking to my wife. Well, in the meantime, on the phone, in Ray Downey fashion, with his his his, his way of, of, of speaking and his command presence, I would call it, he, he says, listen. I, and I said to him, I said, I'm on the chief's list. I says, I'm on the list. I don't know if I'm getting promoted. My list number, ironically, was 227 in my first company. <laughs> wow. So I said, I don't think I'm getting promoted. because, But they were promoting for a while, and then they kind of stopped. I said, I'm on the list. He says, listen, I just need somebody to do this for a couple of years. And then he, uh, I got back to him the next day. I talked to my wife, and I said, all right, I'm in. And then yeah. I, that was it. And then uh, I came, he said, all right, you got to be at headquarters tomorrow morning on 0900 for an interview with the commissioner and chief of the department. I said, 10-4, I'll be there. And that was that. Wow. Except I didn't get the call from Ray. Uh, I was the captain of the 35 truck. Uh, of course, I saw it on the order. I entertained the thought. Oh, boy, would I love to do that. But to tell you the truth, and I, I knew Ray, uh, but I felt he was only going to hire those guys that ever worked with him. Nepotism. And I didn't want to kiss his ring. Oh. You know, I felt I would have had to go see him, kiss the ring, blah, blah, blah. And I was on vacation, and I got a phone call at home from Von Essen. And he asked me if I would like to be the captain of Squad 18. And I says, I'd, I'd like to talk it over with my wife. And he says, I got to know now. I says, the answer is yes. And he says, good, come in tomorrow and uh, have an interview with Gansey. Uh, Crazy, right? And that's how it went. Yeah. Got out there the last day like you. We met you out there the last day yeah. at the tryouts. Yeah. Well, I, I've told you my, uh, my, uh, my story. It is quite a story, so it's... <laughs> I'll give you the abridged version. I was uh, doing a try. I had just gotten promoted to captain. I was doing a training detail with my good friend, the late Brian Hickey, uh, and we were doing uh, the commissioner. We, I was working in the commissioner's office, out of the commissioner's office at, at operations. Um, but uh, we were doing PowerPoint had just become a thing, and we were taking photographs of companies' buildings and showing them at company drills, and then we upped it to like we were showing uh, like we do today you know get an auditorium full of guys and uh, and show them uh, do a drill and we pick building construction so so Brian and I would go around doing this so I'm doing that one day and I'm on my way home and I'm by Kennedy Airport and it's a monsoon I remember that and Eddie Garrity calls me so Eddie Garrity is the assistant to the uh, 
to the fire commissioner, and we all know him. Uh, he, he also passed on 9-11, a great man, uh, worked with his brothers. Uh, so I get, Eddie goes to me, he goes, the commissioner wants to see you. Like, I'm on the car, I'm driving home, you know? And I'm like, okay. So it takes me like about an hour to get back downtown because it's a monsoon. I pull downstairs, take the elevator up. And like I've told you guys, I thought that the two drills a day that I was doing because they absolutely wanted two drills a day, and I was delivering two drills a day every day, along with uh, Captain Hickey, was about to catch up with me when I got out of the elevator <laughs> on the, uh, on the, what is it, the seventh or the eighth floor, or whatever it is. Eighth uh, floor, eighth that floor. would be. That would be the eighth floor, 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 right. So, uh, so I get out of the elevator, on the way up in the elevator, I'm going, well, should I admit it, or should I just, you know, just stick to my story? That's why I'm just staying captain's management till I'm about 90, you know? <laughs> so this, so I get out, I go into the conference room, and um, there's, uh, Commissioner, Fee, uh, Commissioner uh, Von Essen, Commissioner Feehan, uh, Ray Downey, Pete Gancy, Ray Goldback, Eddie Garrity, and there may have been a few other people there. I'm not. I'm not really sure. And they go sit down, and I'm like, I, I still think I'm, I, there's a very good possibility I'm getting hooked up here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is true, you know. So anyway, I sit down, and exactly what happened with you was, um, why didn't you try out for the squats? And I'm like, like I said before, I said, well, I was always told the squad was an engine with a roof rope, you know, when I was in 111. That's what we used to kid around about. So they said, no, we're serious. Why, why didn't you? Well, I said, I, I, Brian Hickey had asked me about that, too. And Brian did try out, but he didn't get the, he, they didn't offer him the squad that he wanted or whatever. Or he only wanted one or two of them. So anyway, um, so they asked me. And, um, and I said, same thing. You guys said, let me think about it. And they gave me overnight. <laughs> to think about it and you know when on the way home or actually on the way out uh, Chief Gancy grabbed me and Chief Downey and then Eddie Garrity called me on the way home and uh, you know I pretty much made up my mind on the way out but I, I waited till the next morning and told him yeah I'm in and uh, that was it you know and uh, and then it was off to the races like these guys will tell you um, it was all in immediately right, it right. was a hundred miles an hour right off the bat you know and then you had a, like these guys had very tough decisions to make like who am I keeping who am I who am I letting go and it was not it was it was a lot it was a lot of work in a very short period of time we've talked about it before it was only a couple of weeks before we actually got into the firehouse you know yeah. after that it was uh I would call it stressful. Yeah, yeah. It was. And nobody it was, saw it. It was stressful. Nobody saw it. And you had to make decisions, adult decisions. Uh, like, let's say, the officers, if you will. There was three officers there. <clears throat> and I had to think, now, we're taking an engine company, and we're bringing in new, new blood, if you will, from all over the job. <clears throat> and we have to bring them up to the performance of, let's say, a special operations command, a unit. So these uh, three officers, and it was an engine company, and I'm thinking to myself, did any one of these officers ever hold a drill with their firefighters, a forcible entry drill? In other words, an engine officer could hold a forcible entry drill because his firefighters could get detailed out to a truck, just like a truck officer could hold a drill about the pump, you know, a water, because you can get detailed to an engine type thing. So I'm thinking to myself, no, these guys are not gonna transform overnight and all of a sudden become uh, a training officer for high angle, confined space. I want three new officers. So that was my premise on that. Uh, I was intimidated by that. I don't know about you guys. I was intimidated by that fact that, you know, we were going to companies that were companies. Yeah. Like these are people, and we all worked in good companies. We yeah. all worked in companies. And, you know, when you're on this job, your company, as far as you're concerned, is the best company in the job. So now we're going in. You know, all of those companies had captains, every one of them, uh, except you were the captain, right? Right. Well, uh, so going in there now, now we're, we're tasked with like, oh my God, you know? And these guys went to the wind too. Yes. Yeah. You know, I know the captain in uh, Frank Connors in 288 wound up being a covering officer in the 14th yeah. division. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah uh, and I remember going, I said, you know, how am I going to handle this? Like, I, you know, it, like you said, it was just the, the planning and the thinking and the logistics, and I'm like, how am I going to do this? So I made a decision because we were told initially, right, we were going there on March 1st 
but we were going to be an engine for the couple of months while we got the training, right? So I'm like, all right. I remember going in and having a meeting, having a company meeting yeah, we did that too. with the members that were there. I remember walking into the kitchen in 270. I remember walking in and I was like, the place was like kind of a, um, they had a temporary kitchen because they were the place was kind of messed up a little bit. Mm-hmm. I remember going in the kitchen and all the guys came in. I personally called every guy and said, I'm going to have a company meeting. I'd like you to come. I remember sitting in the kitchen. I remember a couple of the guys sitting there just staring me down. Like, they don't know who I am. And the battalion commander in the 5-0 battalion was ADC the night I had the company meeting. Mm -hmm. And once you know, he came down to the kitchen and he sat in on the meeting. And I pretty much said, you know what, man? Game on, like you said, game on. And I was like, I'm just going to lay the law down. I'm going to lay the rules out, my expectations. You know, I don't tolerate medical leave abuse and this and blah, 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 blah. This is what we're going to do. We're going to be a great company. I'll give everybody here a shot. Anybody wants to stay, I'm in, you could stay. But it was intimidating. I was intimidated. Like, wow. I really was. I was a nervous yeah. wreck, actually. But it kind of all worked out. Kinda yeah, my story out. is quite a bit different. I got to tell you, a lot different because I was, I was the captain in 252. <coughs> with the idea of the squads coming up, uh, I, I interviewed all my guys. We sat down as a company meeting, as you did, with the guys that you didn't know. But I knew these guys, and uh, I knew their capabilities. They were, it was a driven company that uh, had a proud history, and these guys, you know, they, they thought they were the best, and I felt they were too. And uh, as we, you know, started to train, they started to train before we were going into the training for the squads, you know, truck work. We had some guys that came from trucks already. Uh, we had Tommy Kavekis, Kavekis, home run of a guy, Richie Sweeney. Yeah. I mean, Richie Sweeney studied Lattice three from the day he got on the job, and he, and, and he was just like a truckie at heart. So, uh, you know, dealing with those guys and Marty McHale, I mean, I could go through the whole roster. There's not a guy that I thought would not be able to cut it. So, um, you know, I was proud to say that, and when we went to headquarters, when I met you guys, I, we knew each other before, but now, now we're sitting at that big table in headquarters. We talk, and they're talking about you know the squad <coughs> thing coming up, and what are you going to do with your rosters and all? And I said like, I got 19 guys that are in. I'm sorry to say one guy is going to want to leave because he, you know, he's suffering from back injuries and stuff, and he didn't think it was for him. Um, and that's that's how we started. So and the 19 were a home run. And I got to see all these guys in the tr- so-called tryout, which was not a very popular thing, mm-hmm. as they talked about it on the job. Yeah, right. But, uh, you know, and guys approached me that wanted to work in the neighborhood. And, and I knew a, f- a few of them, uh, as, as we know. Norton. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Burke, you know. He, he, had, uh, he, had, he had street Norton. credibility, I would oh, say. Absolutely. <laughs> and he kept, uh, kept the other guys out of trouble because he was always bringing it on himself. <laughs> And uh, it, it was a great opportunity for these guys. And um, as I said, I wasn't on a chief's list. That kind of helped, I guess, in uh, headquarters deciding, like, uh, I'm going to be there for a while, and I, and I wanted to, you know. So uh, it, it was great. I mean, uh, the highlight of my career, actually, although every place I ever worked in, you know, I loved it. Right. And the guys were great all around the job. But, uh, yeah, this was a, a special thing that was being yeah, delivered a to, gift. To, to these five companies. Yeah. And it, actually there was a sixth, it was 23 engine, I believe, at the time. And, oh, yeah, and they dropped that. out. And they 23 said, well, or 44? I no, no, it was it 23? 23. Yeah, it, it was. was. And they, that was a senior house. and Because yeah. I remember the guys, yeah. no, 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 this is not for us. We're all, you know, one step right. going out the door yeah, right. kind of thing. And uh, okay. so they said, well, we'll have a lot of spare equipment in case, uh, you know, because <laughs> they were equipping six right. squads. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's kind of the story for 252. Wow. And I'd ever, love to turn back the clock. They they ever I remember some conversations around the fact that they picked those companies because they were, uh, they, they, they were all single companies except for 288. Right. But they didn't do a lot of running. They didn't have a. They didn't do a lot of running. You know, they weren't like busy engines, like running, running, running. Right. Uh, I, obviously, the geographic location, I guess, was part of the yeah. uh, part of the uh, like 288. I guess going to the city. Right. You know, we were in mm. South Queens, 
Stevie was on the borderline of Queens. Yeah. And we were kind of saturated with yeah. engines over there. Yes. Really. Yeah. You, know, we, yeah. you had four engines yeah. in front of the building, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, northern Brooklyn. Is four minutes, you had four engines. So it's, uh, they could spare yeah. us from the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I think, the, the, I know the runs had a lot to do with it. I remember <coughs> talking to Ray Downey and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the amount of running uh, had a lot to do with picking those units. Yeah, we, we had virtually no input at all. I mean, I can, I can tell you, at least from my end, like I said, uh, Commissioner Feehan, who I know was involved with it, and again with the, with Chief Downey at the time, I think they were basically two guys in a room, maybe Chief Gancy also, and they 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 just made a, the decision. Right. And, and by and large, it worked out pretty good. Yeah. There were some conflicts that were fairly significant, uh, especially with us, I think. But, you know, it is what it is. Right. They, they haven't moved anybody. No, so, right, you right. know, so it can't be that well, bad. Well, they, they was talking closing 252 even that's after 9-11. Right. Right. Oh, and yeah, they were going to yeah, move right. on maybe to 44, which oh, then I they made 44 that, yeah. a rescue. Uh, uh, hazmat. Or hazmat. 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 Yeah. yeah. I know they, they were talking about, because uh, we had mentioned this once before, that they were going to, after 9-11, they were going to roll up all the squads yeah. Yeah. And, and recapitalize the yeah. rescues, which I can understand. Um, mm. Wouldn't have liked it, but uh, could understand why. You, can, you, know, you can't take that much of a hit and not have to make adjustments. But... Uh, but I think the fact that um, you know they opened up another squad in Staten Island and right. uh, the program, you know, SOC has expanded since yeah, right. since then. Right. I mean, it's it's all a um, a testament to uh, really forward looking. You know, right. after nine, especially after 9/11, seeing what the threat really is, which yes. we were kind of cued in on it. Then we knew sure. something was going to happen at the Millennium at 1999. Right. Right. We were, I mean, that got pounded yeah. into uh, us that we were going to get hit on on right. the year 2000. Yeah. So it wasn't like we weren't weren't thinking about that. Yeah. We really were thinking about yeah. that quite a bit. Um, and I think that the moves that the job has made, you know, since I retired have, have been to, you know, strengthen that mm -hmm. even going forward. I don't know if you guys remember too, I don't know if you even knew this, the one pitch that I was trying to make to Von Essen when they, when they started the companies, I wanted the companies, I said, we should, the numbers of the companies should be the division. Interesting. Like squad idea. 13, squad right, 14, 14. Wow. Yeah. right? Now, Squad 18 would have been tough because you're, yeah. you know, we already had a squad one, right? right. But I, I made a pitch for it. Yeah. And uh, they said, nah, you know. And, and Bill Feehan, I think, was probably the guy that maybe put the squash on that too because, you know, he was a, a, a guy that had been around a very long time. And I, I understood, like, when he explained it, well, you know, you got to understand those companies have identities. Exactly. Right. And, know, a and, they've been, and they have right. a history. So yeah. we kind of, like, disrespectful. So I said, I got it, you know. But... I remember, like, you know, because I thought, well, we're starting a new company. So we want to have your own identity. Have our own identity, right? right? But yeah. I got it. So, and it all worked out. Yeah. You know, yeah, actually, out. they were talking about making us, calling us Squad 4. And Squad 4 was right. in with 283. 283 years ago, yeah. You know, and, uh, sure. But, you know, yeah. keeping the company number, I think, was important. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, was, it was definitely important for, uh, you know, that was, the, you're right, that was there. I had asked the same thing, and it was, uh, you know, because as we're looking at it one way, you know, mm -hmm. like you want your own identity, but yeah. on the other hand, you know, you have that, um, you have that uh, connection to your community. Sure, right? so, sure, all right. And that's sure. the way they looked at it, you know, I yeah. think, because it's also political, too. hundred percent. You know, they got to go in front of the city Absolute, council. Absolutely they gotta, right. You know, yeah, yeah. So. Absolutely right. Probably at that time, uh, I had no idea how many former members were going to stay uh, that I would have to fill the roster, you know, from there. Mm -hmm. uh, I just went out there to say, well, what sort of evolutions are they running them through? Uh, how difficult are they? Uh, things like that. Uh, they had firefighters uh, stretching a two and a half, handling a nozzle, and believe it or not, uh, one firefighter who was a 547 engine that impressed me a lot handling a two and a half by himself without a backup man was uh, John Esposito who's the chief of operations right now uh, I'm serious uh, so I made sure to remember his name uh, and another firefighter that I knew the name uh, and he was a senior man in 175 truck Harry Lee Davis mm. Uh, and I knew the name because, to tell you the truth, <coughs> what was the former captain of Engine 18, uh, Jimmy Garish. Yeah. Uh, he was also a firefighter in 175. And he, he liked uh, Harry Lee. And when there was talk of 18 becoming uh, a squad, Garish was uh, actually opposed to it. 
I even think he threatened uh, the commissioner to say, I'll go to the community board if you think you're going to make this a squad. So that uh, signed his death certificate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Harry Lee was out there on the last day. And you know what? Uh, Harry and I are the same age, sort of. Uh, but you know what? He was a senior man. And I knew he could cut roofs. I knew he could force doors. I knew he could uh, drive a tiller. I, you know, it was all the things. If I was going to need any firefighters, I needed firefighters that could also teach other firefighters. Because the ones that were going to remain were basically engine firefighters. Now we're going to learn truck work. And you got to think like a truckie as well if you're going to respond in as a, a squad. It's a whole different mindset. Uh, so I was looking for those firefighters that could, uh, you know, uh, be mentors in the firehouse. But it was only one day, you know. But it was one day that, you know what, it was a gift. No, but you know what, we, we all knew, uh, you know, we were under the gun. I mean, you know, uh, it was good to hear you say that, Tom, because I, I kind of felt the same way, you know. It was yeah. like... I felt like I was doing something that I really wasn't that prepared to do, you know, like I wasn't, you know, when I think any of us are sitting there looking at, like in our heads, projecting our career path, you know, I just got promoted to captain, all right, where do I want to, where do I see myself in five yeah, years, yeah, you know, yeah, right. this was not it, you know, right, this was right. definitely not it, and, um, <clears throat> but it was really an honor to get to do it, uh, but that that first day, that, that well, last day of the tryouts, I just looked for really <clears throat> young guys uh, that, um, you know, uh, like Jerry was saying, um, guys that showed proficiency, you know, in the basics, because that's what you guys were doing was the basics, and uh, try to pick a few few good guys that would be good. And, and I think basically almost everybody we picked worked out. Uh, and then, you know, I had, because my situation was very different, mm -hmm. I, was, I, I was bringing in like my own offices and eight guys, but eight guys is like a third of your company. So those guys, as it turned out, were all pretty much experienced, for the most part, truckies. I had a little bit of the opposite problem. I spent a lot of that time between when we formed and we went online as a squad when we were there, working on engine operations. Mm -hmm. Like these guys will tell you, right. we were going to boxes, every phone alarm was like when I was a probie, every phone alarm we were stretching to the door. There you go. Right. And you know, that was just old school. I mean, I think I had Chief Asserno came up to me, he goes, I haven't seen this in 20 years, <laughs> you know? But, but Mm -hmm. It was. It wasn't for them. It wasn't to make a, a point with the, with the surrounding companies or the chiefs. It was to start to develop a little muscle memory with you guys. You know. Okay. We stretch. So if I tell you to stretch, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, we've never done this before. Right. You know. I know right. we've done this plenty of times Absolutely before. Right. So that was kind of like where we yeah. were. But and I had a good core of senior guys that were had good truck skills that we branched out into eventually. Uh, but again, every every each of the squads were different. Mm -hmm. Each yeah. of them had little different uh, nuances yeah, yeah, with yeah. them. We did a lot of vehicle extrication. I remember going to Chief Downey right after we started, and saying, <clears throat> you know, I need a full hearse to set up here. I mean, I have to have it because I'm getting in. in you got, I'm getting it first due by a mile sure. on the LIE, and it's taking companies ten minutes to get to get in. They had a little construction entrance right out right down the block from the firehouse to get onto the LIE. So we didn't have to go down to the regular right. entrance to come back. We'd go down this little hill that they brought the construction vehicles on, and we were right on, you know? And then, so the other companies are going down to the next exit, going down to Queens Boulevard and getting on, and, you know, that became a priority. So that, you know, and I gotta say, uh, Chief Downey, no problem, he, he well. hooked me right up, you know? So it really was, it was a tremendous, it was, it was like, it was a tremendous honor, and it was a big challenge, but I think, that all of us brought really, really talented people into something very new that nobody had a depth of experience in before or any experience doing, and we made it work. I mean, I think we all made it work, you know? I and you look a, where it is today. I was in a little different position because I had some more time, <clears throat> like these guys had a day. I, I had been, you know, <laughs> asked to take the company maybe well before that, so I, I don't think it was the full two weeks, but I was there for quite a few days. And I knew I had had that company meeting, and I knew 270 was already short staffed, so it was a four firefighter engine, but they only had like 14 guys on the roster. And right out of the gate, when I said, just let me know if you want to stay, you don't want to stay. And about, I, I only had like five or six guys that were staying. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to pick <coughs> 19 firefighters. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the three officers. I already got, I had gotten told by Vanessa, you're getting slow. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I only had two picks for company, company comes with Sloan. Company comes with Sloan. But I, I tried to mix it up like you guys. And I wanted some young blood, and I wanted some senior talent 
that could be the teachers, could be the mentors, could be the the, the and, and I, I wanted some truck guys, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and so I, I I was fortunate, but I I, I had to pick nineteen people. Yeah. Wow. It was a lot. It was a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I I kind of had the opposite of that. I had nineteen who were staying. So I I want I was looking for seven or eight guys. I was trying to actually go above the roster, right. which we were right. asked to keep right. it to 25. I was pushing to get to like maybe 27 yeah. just in case, yeah. you know, something happened with a couple of guys. But uh, my 19 guys had to go through the same evaluation process, you know, and we would get evaluation sheets back. I mean, <coughs> Captain Ellison, Jimmy Ellison was, would hand evaluate the guys right. and I'd get the stack of evaluations. And um, so, but my guys, while they were there, they were recruiting themselves. You know, right, let, right. Let, yeah, I, they were pointing guys out. This guy's good. That guy's good. He wants to nice. come here. You, you wanted guys that want to come here, right. you know. And there were a few when we finally got to the selection process in headquarters. Yes. You know. The Little League draft. Yeah, that, it was, you know, it was, it was interesting because uh, any one of you guys could pick the guy that right. I want. I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you Dennis, you Eric did. You stole Eric Allen. <laughs> you'll yeah, right. you'll appreciate you Joe Hunter. Joe Hunter. Joe Hunter. <laughs> You'll I told Joe Hunter that, yeah. just, so, just so you know, yeah. he knew that you wanted Yeah, him. no, I love Joe Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all, we all yeah. know. What a, what a guy. What a guy. So, so I told Jerry that you'd appreciate this. Tommy Bone, God rest his soul, calls me on the phone. This is after the tryout thing is over. And I'm, I'm pretty much kind of square on who I want to pick, you know, before we go mm -hmm. to the round table. <laughs> and he calls me and he says, Cap, Tommy Bone, 108 truck. I don't know him from Adam. I don't know him. Oh, well. Wow. I remember, you know, seeing him, but I don't know him. He says, uh, oh, I'm thinking of five. I don't know what to do. You know, and he, he was very indecisive. I mean, so you know, you know how I, I said to him, Tom, I says, we're going to have some fun. And that was it. I hooked him. Yeah. Because yeah. he's a, you know, he's a Exactly. Character. Oh, my God. Big boy. So he's the guy that got Ray Seely to come, too. Mm. Wow. Ray didn't come initially. He came shortly after, and uh, but that those those two guys were like two of the best picks I could ever have had. Like mm -hmm. right, unbelievable, right? I think every time I worked in a place, Ray Seely drove me, yeah. and I know him forever. And uh, Joe, what a great guy! What, Hilarious I mean, too. You, you like can't he, stop laughing. Yeah. Nah, <laughs> you know. he, was, he was great. But yeah, so that that, that was, Tommy Bull, man, he was he was the best. He was such a good guy, man. Do you remember that room? The conference table yeah. and yeah. picking yeah. out the firefighters. Yeah. Do you know who went first? Did you go first? I went first. Did you? Andy. Von Essen said, all right, Tracy, because we picked the officers. Now it's time for the firefighters. All right, Tracy, you go first. I said, well, Commissioner, you know, I'm coming from 35 trucks, so I'm bringing a firefighter with me, Larry Vigilio, so my first pick will be Andy Fredericks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the response I got yeah, from the room. Yeah, yeah, I got two guys, that's and they would awesome. both, oh, both oh, be yeah. working on 9-11. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But Andy was a, oh, Larry. Larry was special. You know, I was a captain of 35 truck, uh, and he was such uh, yeah, he was a good not guy. only a good firefighter, he was, a, what an outstanding human being. He was a cardiophysiotherapist, uh, one of the hospitals uptown. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we were in the squad, one of his patients was uh, the Masked Marvel, an old wrestler from back in the day. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, so he, he knew the Masked Marvel lived on the Lower East Side in Squala. He didn't even have a refrigerator. And Larry approaches me one day and says, I can get a refrigerator. Would you mind if we brought it over there? I says, not at all. We'll throw it in the second piece. And we drove out of our district. You know, you're not supposed to leave yeah, the yeah, village. Yeah, yeah. I like and, uh, I like that one. Oh, my <laughs> own. More than once did we yeah. leave the district to go yeah. uh, train or drill. And this that? is what Larry was all about. <laughs> That's the kind of human was. being he was. Uh, and rope, see, a uh, standing high <laughs> angle. Yeah. But Andy Fredericks. Don't leave your response. This is a guy who's made an impact on the fire service yeah. at large. Still. Yeah. Even today, right? You know, back in that day, <clears throat> engine company operations had been, uh, let's say, rewritten. And John Salker was given, let's say, the accolades for, oh, John Salker wrote that. No, John Salker didn't write it. Andy Fredericks and John Grasso, who's two firefighters mm. in 48 engine, wrote it. John Grasso, the, yeah day that Andy showed up in 18, 
He put all the fittings that a chauffeur would need for a stamp pipe or an FDC fire, uh, Siamese connection. He put all of those fittings underneath the seat of the rig so that he didn't have to go in the compartment. In other words, he streamlined that rig day one. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about engine company operation. John Grosso go to 61? Yes. He did. Yes. I remember yeah. John. Yeah, yeah. And he was a big boy. He was a big guy. Why, why wasn't he in a he truck? Big, he was a big guy. John Grosso. Yeah. Another, yeah, and both man. of them had degrees in fire science. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so Sokol was privileged to have them as firefighters. They all went when you know certain guys got picked, like you talked about Joe Hunter before Eric Allen. The other captains were, and I did the same thing with some of their guys. You know, because you, you have your guys on a list that you want. You're not going to get everybody. Right. You know, it's going to be <clears> split <throat> up. But it, it was. It was just like a little league draft. You know, I wanted Tommy. You know, <laughs> I wanted Billy. You know, and it's just, and they went. You know. Nobody picked Gary Moore but me. <laughs> <laughs> Big well, duty. You remember at the end, you know, we're done, right? We're, we're finished. And uh, um, Commissioner Von Essen goes to Commissioner Feehan, like he's whispering, like he's asking him, like, what do you think, Bill? You think you think he'll take Billy quick? <laughs> oh, like, ah. like, like, it, like it's a question, like he's got to ask my permission, you know? It's like, so, since I didn't get since I didn't get the call from uh, Downey, and I got the call from Von Essen, so I'm sitting next to Downey in the conference room. He's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I said, "Can I call you Dad?" <laughs> <laughs> I thought there'd be friction. Yeah. Well, you're taking you're, you're taking some of their boxes. I mean, even when Bobby Gallione was on, <laughs> he made mention of that, and it's like nobody wants to lose work. Right. You know, if they put another squad in Northern Queens and another squad in Southern Queens, right. nobody would be very happy about that. You know, and the guys in those companies now. You know, right. so that that's all. But no, actually, I thought it worked out better than I thought it would because mm -hmm. in the end, after it all calmed down. Um, Everybody gets to know everybody. This is not a big opera, you know, this is not a huge command. I mean, it's much bigger now than it was when I was working, but everybody knows everybody, you know? And, and, and actually, it's a stepping stone for young guys that came into the squads in those days, and I think it still is, to go to the rescues if they want, mm -hmm. you know, because you get to, you're gonna be working in those companies, you know, you're gonna yeah. be working on details in those companies, and when you go to the schools, everybody <laughs> sees everybody, Oh, that guy's really talented with ropes, so that guy is very, very good with rigging, you know. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. especially the guys that work on the outside and the trades, man. They you make a good point about when we were going through all the training, a lot of the rescue firefighters were doing all the technical yeah. rescue training, yeah. and they started to get to know all these young kids. I think, mm -hmm. I think they enjoyed it, you know, trying to develop right. these guys, right? right? As far as 270 was concerned, well, I knew there was going to be some hard feelings because most of the work you know like we were right near the work exactly. like south yeah, queens right man right. we well, were killing them in we were killing it and i remember <clears throat> working in rescue four as a firefighter getting detailed down how long it would take to drive right. to south jamaica and i think this is going to be unbelievable we're gonna, like we're going to get in there and we did and it took it took time though though to build the relationships with the chiefs because it wasn't good at first. Right. I'm sure no, everybody. Was, oh, stand no, no, no. fast. It was yeah. it was very very difficult, and one thing that I told our guys, I said, listen, I know you got this. These squads were developed for hazmat. That was the whole premise initially. Right. But the uh, you know, and they were smart enough, Downey and all those guys. They were smart enough to. Nobody's going to these companies unless they could go to fire. Right. Right. So that's how they right. Yeah, but I said to the guys, we have to be <coughs> really good at hazmat stuff, even if we have to fake it. We got to be good at it <laughs> because <laughs> because if we're the not, gets, yeah. they're not going to use us as fire. Yeah, exactly. And I used to say that all the time. So we drilled a lot with whatever the tools we got initially. You know, uh, we we wanted to make sure we knew yeah. halfway what we were talking about and you know, waiting for hazmat to come, right? You know, you were in quarters with them, so yeah. that was that was probably helpful. And we had to wait. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But it was, uh, it was, it was that, it, 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 certainly there was some hard feelings, I think, initially, 
But I think, like Dennis said, any time when we got to know everybody, right. then it kind of, and the command became the command. Yeah. Remember, when we were in the <coughs> rescue, we were in the battalion. Yeah. We were in the 5-7 yeah. battalion. Nobody remembers that now. We were in the 5-7 yeah. battalion. We would work in the battalion. That's yeah. where we got our details. Right. And it was one truck in the battalion. That's mm -hmm. right, 111. So 90% of the time you were yeah. going to 111, but yeah. well, 111 was going to rescue. Yeah. Right. And then they started to develop back then rescue services. So we did get detail to the other companies once in a while. But um, but then the command just grew, like from the squads. Yeah. That that was when it grew. You know, uh, I remember Farnesson, uh, we were at something. And I was, you know, I was in 270, and we're at something, and uh, Parnesson says something like, you know what? He says, I don't even know what this guy Downey does half the time. He says, but whatever he's doing is working, so I'm just going to leave him alone, like, you know. <laughs> and he built the freaking empire, like, yeah. right? I tell you what, what a smart, smart man. Right? Oh. Visionary, like, right? Exactly. Yeah, you say? Without, like, without visionary, right? Yeah. Well, he <coughs> the USAR teams, and you know what the inception uh, and how they came about? Uh, Liamban's collapse. It was a building up being built in Connecticut that oh, was that. Oh, yeah. the tilt, the tilt yeah. it wasn't tilt slab, it was lift slab. slab. All the floors okay. were poured okay. and they had uh, lift maybe about four floors and how they were being held on the perimeter and uh, near the core. Uh, one of, let's say, uh, the whatever you would call them, whatever accessories uh, was holding the slab uh, was faulty, let go, and the rest of them uh, couldn't handle it. 29 uh, construction workers right. uh, were killed. killed. Right. A firefighter from Hazmat was coming home from vacation, was driving like on 95 and sees the event uh, happening, drives over there and tells them that they had a camera that they could stick in voids. Uh, and they called it and Hazmat responded and this and that. Ray got up there and that was thought of, wow, we need teams yeah, of specialists yeah. for things like this, is, was the inception of the USA. Yeah. I know I spoke with uh, Commissioner Fian, you know, because he, he drew it back to years before when there were so many squads. And he said that would be a great idea to start the squads again, and that would handle the has help with the hazmat situation, yeah. if the terrorism and all. They had a right. meeting down in D.C. or something like that, and they asked FDNY uh, or the city, the mayor's there, and everything. You know, how are you guys handling it? He says well, we have hazmat units all over the city. Some some answer along those lines, and uh, they said no, no. You know, we have one hazmat unit. Yeah. So how are you going to handle yeah. this? Yeah. So that's. You know, the inception of the squads yeah. in uh, Chief, uh, Commissioner Fee, and he'd rather be called Chief uh, Fee, and, and that's how he presented it to us. But he said, wow. as you said before, the only way we're going to get guys motivated for this is to let them go to fires. Yeah. Jack Fanning. Oh, yeah. Oh. Jack Fanning was gentleman. Chief of Hazmat. So between him and Downey, you know, like, of course, I guess mm -hmm. Bill Fee maybe had the concept. And, you know, I guess they all had, like you said, you yeah. were downtown, so there was things yeah. going on. But Jack Fanning was a, a big part of it, too, I think, you know, yeah. initially. I, I, I think sometimes his, his name gets forgotten a little bit, yeah. you know, yeah. honestly. Yeah, I, sure. I, I do. Sure. Well, I, think, I think one of the things that happened was in what we were formed in 98. So I think somewhere in, the, in late 97, from what I remember, and I think it was a WNYF article about this, but they, were, they held an exercise, and it was called ISEX. And it stood for interagency chemical exercise. And one of the guys, along with the guys that you just mentioned, was a guy named Mike Byrne who worked downtown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Mike later went to FEMA yes. and stuff, but he was very involved in, I think, facilitating that drill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was not our finest moment, the FDNY. I'll just leave it at that. All right. And that was the and the the, the thing that happened was we had to put. I don't know what the number was. A certain number of people in level A suits, and. It didn't go well. So I think that was the driving force for everything that followed and the mm -hmm. people that got involved with it mm -hmm. with some very talented people. Uh, and then I think the idea between, uh, like has been mentioned before about, well, you got to get guys that are willing to do this. It's not the most popular thing in the fire department. Anybody that's ever put one of these things on uh, knows, especially in warm weather, it's, it's challenging. Um, 
don't drop the rag. That's what I remember getting out of the oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't don't drop the rag. Don't and for those of you guys that don't know what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is when you wear a level A suit, you always have a towel or something here under your SCBA strap. And uh, because your window fogs up so much. So you have your SCBA on, you're on air, and you have the window and you gotta wipe it off all yeah. the time. And yeah. it's it, it it is very, you very take challenging. Your arm out. Oh, yeah, so yeah. You have right. to take your arm oh, out of the right. sleeve, out of the glove, right. hold it with the other right. one, and then grab the Ooh, grab the towel. <laughs> so to get guys that will do this, what what we were just talking about is um, you got to have them motivated. And how are you going to get guys that number one they'll do it because as already been mentioned, nobody wants to embarrass their company. So if we got to go and we got to do mm -hmm. a level A suits, a level B, C, D, whatever it is. We're all trained to do it, and we practice in the firehouse, and then we practice at the Rock uh, or at Hazmat Ops. But the company pride thing takes over. You know, none of us, you know, you guys didn't want to do it, uh, but we also knew that we were eventually going to get put in calm's way with this stuff, and it did happen. Uh, I remember going to a hospital, and uh, it was it was it was really on. Whatever that cauterizing stuff is, when they uh, not cauterize, uh, when they disinfect like surgical instruments and stuff. It's toxic, it's explosive, and it was for real. It was for real. So as much as we would kid around about it, because 90% of what we do with hazmat uh, was and still is uh, petroleum spills, uh, occasionally it gets real. And, uh, and you knew that it's just like everything else in firefighting, you know, you, you may go to a fire that involves a certain chemical or a certain series of events, and you don't, you know, there are no routine fires, but let's face it, we're more comfortable at working at certain things than we are mm -hmm. at others, and uh, you, you, you do fine. But then there are these oddballs, the things, the low-frequency, high-risk incidents, and man, you know, they get everybody's attention, the pucker factor goes way up, and you know, you gotta be ready for that. So that interagency chemical exercise was what drove this. It's one of the biggest things, motivators I think we have, is embarrassment. We don't want, we want to be pr we're proud of what we do. Right. We want to do everything well, and we don't want to be embarrassed. And uh, so that was, I mm -hmm. think, the motivating factor for everything else that followed and all the, the great people we were just talking about, so. I remember the, the day that I got told, you know, you get in the company after the interview process. I remember Bill Feehan calling me up to his office. And he, he, he explained, he said, listen, and I didn't know him. Didn't know him, I didn't know Von Essen, I never met them. And Bill Fian sits me down and it was like talking to my father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's that kind of guy, you know. Tommy, you know, I just want to let you know, man, this is a big deal. This is like a big initiative. This is really a big deal for the New York City Fire Department. We're happy to have you on board. And he kind of gave me a pep talk, you know, and uh, he, he, was, he was serious, but he was so calming. Like I found him to be very calming, and uh, yeah. and he he, uh, we know you guys are going to do a great job. He said, but we really want you to understand that this is a big deal. So, I, I, I you know I took that to heart, and I mm -hmm. said, I got it, man. No no problem. I appreciate that. You know, pretty much we all got the same complement of tools. Right. Um, you know, we got the second piece, which was for hazmat and, mm -hmm. and all the hazmat equipment that went along with that, and then you know extrication ropes, uh, you know, you name it, you know. It came like it was Christmas morning, you know, these guys, <laughs> you know, they couldn't wait to, yeah. to break yeah. into this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was a good thing that, you know, there's a little sidelight to what you just said because it brings me back to a day when we were out there drilling. I had my guys, we were doing extrication down the block right on uh, Central Avenue. We were all on one side of the rig and uh, taking this car apart, you know, everybody was into it. And uh, then when we started putting things back, they went to the other side of the rig and realize the cabinets are open, tools are missing. <laughs> oh we got ripped off right, oh right where we stood, and uh, it, it, it created a, a, a serious search of the subways and everything else, and we think we found the guy, but not the tools, and he's not well today. But <laughs> <laughs> so the guy said, we talk about embarrassment, right? I said, how did Ray Downey respond to that? Well, I was curious. How did Ray Downey? <laughs> we bought some tools. That's how Ray Downey responded. Wow. Yeah. You know, sawzalls were gone, and uh, That's funny. you know, really, you know, we found an empty box in the subway. But uh, yeah, the uh, the complement of tools we got was uh, staggering for the for the time. Yeah. To, as you say, to going from an engine and getting all this equipment. But we we had the guys that were up to the task. We, a lot of these guys were very mechanically inclined, and for the guys that weren't, you know, they got on board. 
Yeah, yeah, it was good. Ray could be uh, pretty blunt on a phone call. <laughs> no oh, that's a nice way, that's for a nice way to put it, Jerry. <laughs> you, you got those phone calls, right? Oh, I My I wife would answer, would answer the phone, and she'd say, oh, hold for Chief Downey. I said, that's not good, you know? <laughs> and it wasn't, and it usually wasn't, but it, what a gentleman, and I said, like, uh, oh, yeah. you know, usually you Tommy agree. Burke's name came up in the conversation. <laughs> 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 like a 25-inch TV out of the 10th floor of a project that ruptured the standpipe supply line. Uh, but, yes, that would be minor, us. Minor issue. Minor <laughs> you know. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Yes, that would be us. Remember, we were able to do our roster staffing not on the chart. We were doing 24 a quarter. I don't know if you guys I do. don't remember it, but we, yeah. We, so that's what you had to do. You had to do 20, everybody had to do 24 a quarter. So I would tell yeah, the guys, yes, yes. listen, just we you know we told the officers and we would say listen just look when there's openings in the company and put yourself in the book for, for roster but you get to the end we i had a i had a whiteboard in the office for day tours for night tours and i said and i used to say listen this is this is like we got to get this right. right and when you you had to send in the monthly reports mm -hmm. or whatever the quarterly reports whatever and if every, if guys didn't have their 24 a quarter and it was not a good excuse I remember getting called up a few times. I got called for 72 and yeah. a quarter. Because <laughs> he, he was Tommy. getting called yeah. up. You know, yeah, exactly. Because he was getting it. Yeah. And, it, you yeah. know, I'm sure, you know, this was a priority for everybody. Because the unions weren't happy about it, that we weren't right. doing it by the schedule. Right. We weren't right. doing it by the schedule because sock and this and that. But he, ha he had that side of it, and you and I both saw yeah. it on Bergen yeah. Street yes. also. Yes. Yes. He, he could be very gruff, you know. But on the other hand, he had this other side of him. Oh. Like we used to, I don't, you might even been working a day. Remember the day he told us he was going to Armenia on a retreat? Yes, yes. We're sitting, yes, in, the we're sitting in the kitchen table I and do. we're like going, like we're looking at each other going, oh, I want to party with you while, you know? <laughs> so, so, but you think about it, he was so religious and, he and was, he, he was sincere, yes, you know, yeah, but he didn't yeah. share, you, you know, he didn't right. put it in your face. It that's was not, right. you know, you just found out I'm going on a retreat. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, my wife got sick um, and she was seriously sick and man, he couldn't have been better, man. He was like, you're off the chart, let me know when you're back. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, that's to me, like we talk about on this program a lot about leadership lessons. You mm -hmm. take care of your people. That's, that's right. And that's probably, John Vigiano used to say that as a captain, that was probably you had the greatest impact that's on right. your people, on the firefighters, Absolutely of right. all the ranks. That, that was, uh, you know, you were able to do things for your guys. I don't know if that's the same anymore. I, I doubt it. But, you know, back then we didn't have the computer oversight that we do today and, right. and all that. But that's, that's a key thing, not only making sure your people come home, which we all know, but taking care of the welfare of your troops. And I mean, now you came in the job well, before us. And, but looking back in the old days, like you went to 108 out of probate school. Did you go there right out of 90 probate? engine first. Okay, and then you went to 100. But even then, when you... In those, like, wasn't it the same back then? The company commander took care of his people. Oh, absolutely. That was the Sal way it Russo was. was my guy. That was the way it oh. was, right? Like, just that's that's that was leadership, right? That right. was, that was the way it was supposed to be, yeah. right? And like, we got a, we had great examples, you yeah, know, in all the places yeah. we worked in. You know what I mean? Yeah. We all had good examples. And I think that's yeah. what Chief Down, when he was Chief Downey, I think that's what he was trying to do. He yes. really let us be captains. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. You know, he, absolutely. It really did. There wasn't a lot of <coughs> there wasn't a lot of micromanaging. Yeah. There were things he had to do, like yeah. you, like yeah. you were saying, mm -hmm. a roster staffing. Yeah. There were some other things because that was being yeah. perused from downtown. Sure. Also, you know, you were going to hear about it, or the chiefs were watching sure. or something. But well, yeah. he was hearing from chiefs in the field as to the performance of the squads, and that was telling him that the captains were doing it. The captains in the offices were doing their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My 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 experience and the opportunity that was given to all of us, uh, I, I, I look back on it and I said, I learned a lot that I think I took with me moving forward. Uh, and when I became a staff chief, I thought that that opportunity really helped me out. You know, yeah. it helped me out a lot. You know, just kind of learning how to manage, like, right? Because that's what you do as you go hiring a job. You do more managing, right? <laughs> and uh, it was really, a, it was a great opportunity, man, right? It wasn't unbelievable. Ah. What a gift. It, was, it, was, it really was. Yeah, I didn't look at it that way at the time. Yeah, and right. it's only in hindsight now, yeah, looking back right, on yeah. it, that I really yeah. realized what a tremendous, like you said, a tremendous honor it really, was. It really was. A tremendous opportunity. Before we were formed, which happened on July 1st, uh, Bill Feehan uh, was on a multiple in Chinatown and special called Engine 18 nice. to operate as a squad. 
<laughs> and it was a Chinese restaurant, you know, where they have the cooked ducks hanging in the window. So before we left, I had a camera with me. I put Gary Moore in front of the picture. I says, I want to take a picture of our first duck fire. <laughs> 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 I don't know that we we did it in one. I think the whole two months in preparation, you know, going through all the training. I think every opportunity we had, at least in my case, uh, I gave the message mostly to the officers. You know, Chris Rigoli, Jimmy Earl, Doug Sloan, and I was just telling them, listen, every tour you work, you just have to let the members. You got to let these folks know that. This is a, like I, like Bill Fehan thought. This is a big deal, mm -hmm. and we have to we have to be good. We have to build credibility. We got to yep. build confidence with the Chiefs, and that was my message most of the time. I said we have to really, and we were lucky too. We were in quarters with the deputies. Yep. That was huge. It was unbelievable. It really helped out a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, but my message was report in, be professional. Do whatever the chiefs tell us to do and be good at it. I says, and uh, make sure that we're giving good reports. Now, you had mentioned this before. You had a lot of young firefighters. I had some young engine. I brought some young truck guys over. And uh, the radio report, like a special unit, as we know, like, you know, from working. Mm -hmm. And when I remember when I went to rescue, I was like, scared to death of giving the wrong report, especially when Ray Downey was working like, <laughs> yeah. but I better give the right report. So I said, we have to make sure we're giving good reports, accurate reports. If we don't know, we don't know. Like don't right. make stint, don't make things up. Like mm. right? that was kind of the, the message that I was kind of portraying most of the time. Just be professional, be good at your job. And, uh, you know, let, let the chiefs know that we're going to be able to do this. Like, you know, whenever you need us. Chief. You know, I uh, thought about it long and hard uh, because we're going to be responding in the first division and the third division. And then <clears throat> look at those companies, you know, 11 truck, you can expect them to do their job. You know, there was other uh, trucks that were all good firemen, but they didn't do that much fire duty. So really my message, and we had a company meeting, and the message was this, we have to earn our credibility. This, this is something we're going to have to earn out there with all of these companies that we're going to be responding to with operating. So the chauffeur is going to the fire floor, you know, if in fact he's not going to be dealing with the water issue outside when we report in. And the inside team is going to the floor above. OV is going to the floor above as well as an OV position. But if the first two OV positions not being taken care of, you got it and let me know. Roof man, you're going to the roof, and I never want to hear squad 18 roofs open. I never want to hear that. Right. When you get up there, there's going to be probably two young firefighters. You walk up there, how you guys, how you doing? See what they need to do, yep. and teach them, mentor them, and have one of them put it on the radio roofs open. Mm -hmm. And maybe when we leave that job, they're going to walk over and shake your hand, say, hey, thanks a lot, and say hello to you at the next fire. In other words, we're going to earn our credibility. And to tell you the truth, I, I gave out <coughs> and made up, and Andy Fredericks helped me, uh, I gave out a three-ring binder to every firefighter in the company, you know, both the ones that <coughs> stayed and the ones that came in new. And basically the first eight pages was, uh, what, is this, what is Squad 18 going to do operating as an engine, first do, second do, third do, in different types of buildings, hand stretching, stamp pipe, all of that. And really Andy wrote that for me. Then after that, it was operating a, as a squad in office buildings, uh, high-rise residential, all the different occupancy types that we could go to, even theaters. And it was what we expect of each position, irons, can, OV, roof. Every one of those positions, they gave them an idea of what's a, because some of them never worked in Manhattan before. And certainly an engine out of Engine 18 never really operated uh, you know, as a truckie in a high-rise building in Midtown Manhattan, all of those things. So more than just the tools, you know, and learning high angle and this and that, they had to really learn how to operate in all of these buildings as well. And uh, you know what? It was a challenge and they, they rose to the occasion. It was great. 
Uh, yeah, some of the Chiefs had to stand fast. One particular job, in the very beginning, McBride from the third division. It's a building under construction on 23rd and about 2nd. Uh, <coughs> reinforced concrete, the uh, <coughs> formwork was up. They got a job on the 21st floor. And while we're responding, getting close, I can hear on a handy talkie, they got a water issue, water pressure issue. So we come in the lobby, squad 18, stand fast, squad. Okay, <laughs> so I tell two of my guys, my chauffeur and Richie Scalfani too, go down in the basement and tell me if there's any issues down there. No sooner did they get in the basement and the water mains that were coming off the uh, Siamese feeding the standpipes, they had openings in them where drain valves were supposed to be and when they're making a swimming pool in the basement. So Scott, Howie Scott calls me up yeah, you know, we got a water leaking in the basement, and now the deputy looks at me, and that's what he should have done to begin with. You know, I got a water issue. Okay, how do we solve it? And I, I've always felt a squad, we respond in a pumper. We should be the kings of water. We should understand standpipe issues, all of that. And we went down to fix that problem for him, and they put out the flame. Now I earned my respect with him. Fill in the gap. Yes. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Well, okay. you guys know we had a uh, we had a company meeting, and um, you know we just laid it all out. We had already had a lot of training. We had already been in service, so it's you know it was an engine, and uh, we kind of were getting an idea of the environment we were going to be operating in. Uh, it was challenging. I mean, I think it was challenging for everybody. It was challenging for us. Um, the uh, it was kind of an adversarial relationship, which I wasn't yeah. really expecting going in there. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to be as bad as it was. Uh, uh, so it was, uh, we had a lot of the same thing you were just talking about. Uh, but eventually, you know, eventually by just persevering and as uh, Tom was saying, being professional, being ready to go, being consistently professional, you win people over. You go in there now and they're looking for these companies, all of them, they're looking for them at jobs. Uh, so that's flipped around and that's kind of what you would expect. You know, the, the job has gotten a lot more junior um, and the fire frequency is way down, so the more experience that you get on, on the fire floor is going to be appreciated. But when we were starting, it was a bit of a fight. And like I told the guys at the meeting, we're going to be going in harm's way. This is no matter what company you come from, a special operations unit is different because you go into everything. You may not do everything, you may not do something at everything, but you're going to be going to everything. So if you're in, you name 108 truck, great, great truck great first to work but if there's a big explosion in bay ridge 108 truck is probably not going there but rescue two is going both of the squads in brooklyn are going and who knows who else is going to be going so that's kind of the difference you know low incident uh low frequency high risk kind of incidents you know planes trains you know um, mass casualty incidents big structural fires explosions you know things things that are risky that you're not going to see that often these units are going to see, not maybe that often, but they're going to see it more than you will in, a, in, a, uh, in your average truck or engine company. So it's a little different in mindset. You got to be kind of on your A game more of the time. You got to be proficient, like we were just saying. With And there is a lot to be proficient with. It's almost like too daunting how much stuff you have to think of all the schools we had to go to. How much schools they got? To, how, the schools that have been added since we've all retired. You know, it's just it's a lot of stuff to be competent in. You know, and to be confident that you you know what you're doing. So, uh, so it's a little different mindset. You know, but it's good. It's good in a lot of ways. You know, you look at uh, you look at 9/11. I mean, certainly special operations. You know, was at the tip of the spear. Uh, you know, everybody who was there was at risk. But certainly, in SOC, you were at a higher risk of going to that. You know, and that could have been, I mean, look at, look at us. We look, open quarters, then you look out and there's the World Trade Center, but it's, I don't know, 10 miles away, you know, but you're looking right at it. But you're still there, you know, still there, still, you know, lost people. So it's, it can happen. And um, that's the difference. That really is the difference. Anybody in a New York City fire department, you know, they say that the biggest act of bravery is raising your hand. That's very true. Uh, but you have a higher probability, I think, in those companies, you know. In the local area, 252's response area, you know, we, the chiefs were familiar with us, obviously, and they knew we were a proud company that did their job. And um, when we went beyond the local area to the other battalions, like the 5735, you know, those chiefs, uh, they wanted to know how they were going to utilize us. I, mean, I, I got a phone call from Dennis Cross, and he says, hey, Cap, you know, like a squad, what am I going to do with you guys? <laughs> and I said, well, 
Chief, we're going to report in, ready to go to work, and you tell us what you want us for. <coughs> we'll, you know, we're here to serve. You know, and that's that's the mindset that we drove into the guys. You know, we're not going to freelance. We're going to avoid freelancing. We're reporting in, but they're going to know that we're ready to help out. We we'll address a problem if it shows up. We we ended up cutting a lot of first floor window bars. You know, because here we are. You know, you got guys inside. The bars need to go. You know, you might deliver that as a to the chief. You want us to take care of that. You know, we're staying intact in case he has something else for us. But we're here to help. You know, and that's. The basic mindset, you know, work on your credibility constantly because it can go out the window in one job. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely, Absolutely yeah. right. You know what? Uh, one of, uh, I guess you could say it was an emergency, was the Condé Nast collapse, uh, the uh -huh. scaffold collapse. And uh, it would be interesting that. <laughs> There would be two squad officers in 18 at that uh, event because uh, Billy McGinn was working the night tour. It was coming in at the change of tours, so I hopped on the rig. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to stay in quarters. <laughs> so uh, Billy went down the block and reported in as a squad, and I'm coming down the block as well. And I just happened to take a, a gander, a look in uh, the Woodstock Hotel, which was right across the street from uh, the collapse. And I saw a gentleman uh, in the lobby, bloody. So I just r walked in the lobby and said, oh, uh, you okay? What happened to you? And he said he was in his apartment and something came crashing. Apartment? Uh, what floor? He was in apartment uh, 1101 on the 11th floor. I says, oh my God. So I got on the radio and I even forget if I said, you know, uh, squad, because Billy McGinn was really the, the officer. But I called Chief Nardona, 9th Battalion, and told him I had an injured civilian here in the Woodstock uh, from such and such a room, and I'll go check it out. What had happened was the mast, the elevator, uh, personal elevator mast, uh, where it broke off and tumbled, uh, punctured the roof and punctured 1201 and got into his apartment, 1101. Uh, and uh, 1201, the door was locked. And the woman was still in the room. In the bathroom. Uh, and, th you know, that morning after we found her and this and that, and that was rather interesting because the, the cops was really not supposed to be, uh, they, they wanted to be in part of everything. And they brought in a dog, and it wasn't even a cadaver dog, it was a patrol dog. And they let the dog uh, loose in the room, and I'm at the door. Uh, and the dog runs into the bathroom and the, guy, the cop is going, oh, we got a hit, we got a hit. And I look and the dog is drinking water out of the toilet. <laughs> uh, I'm saying, wow, I got a hit, huh? Uh, so after that was done and we found the woman, Ray Downey, now this uh, compromise and collapse started at the 21st floor. And Ray had run five miles before coming to work that day. And I'm following him up the stairs and I'm, trying to keep up with him. And I thought I was in shape. Uh, what a day. Yeah, we spent the day. So that was a rather interesting really event. We like two weeks after that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we had one pretty pretty quickly. Uh, we had a, uh, I think we got a unit citation for, we had a man under the train in Queens Plaza South. And um, uh, we had to jack the train. The guy, uh, nice. the guy was, uh, you know, so it's elevated there. And uh, so we're operating over the street. So it's kind of in, pieces so we gotta try to keep them together and um, get his head out of there and the guy lived wow. which was amazing to me I mean, was, we basically had to put him back together again get him in a Stokes basket and then get him up and out but we had him out remember Hank was working near me I forget who else was there um, but um, we got him out in like three minutes wow. four minutes wow. you know, it was a awesome. bottle jack and you know, yeah, just yeah, a boom. Z plate and that was it great but, uh, but so I, 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 and Rescue 4 pulled up. So it had to be a little while because Timmy Kelly had gone to Rescue 4. He says, you need help? And then he goes, I go, no, we got it. You know, he's out. <laughs> so, uh, wow. so that was good. And then the rest were fires, you know. But since you brought up the Condon Nest building, um, we had a night there, like everybody had many nights there, right? So it's like two o'clock in the morning. We're, we're hanging out and it's guys that are in the rig, you know. And uh, I get a phone call to uh, report in to 
a command post. So I go to the command post and uh, Chief uh, is there uh, at the time was uh, Chief Cassano. And uh, he's, he's about as awake as I am at this point. And uh, they said, listen, we got a job for you guys. And I said, okay, the guys are still on the rig, it's just me. Uh, what is that? He says, there's 19 animals in that building <laughs> that have to be removed. The animal rights people have been uh, protesting on the corner. And I said, okay. And he says, come back with uh, one of you guys and we'll, we'll tell you the rest of the story. So I go back to the rig. Richie Myers was the newest guy in the, in the company at the time. So I said, Richie, we got a job. And he says, all right, let's go. So we got our bunker gear on and everything. We go over there. And there's a guy there who is in charge of getting this uh, taken care of. And he's got a list of the animals and wit, the apartments that they're in and the names of the animals, right? <laughs> okay, this is getting crazier as, we, as time goes on. So, and they said, but listen, you know, we don't want you destroying the doors, so we're sending a locksmith with you, and he's gonna pick the lock. We don't want damage to the building. Okay, and he says, you're gonna go in there with these cardboard boxes and duct tape, you're gonna put the animals in the cardboard box. You're gonna bring them down to the garage, and there's gonna be a van waiting to take them to the ASPCA. I said, oh, this is great. Okay, <laughs> so it's, it's me and Rich. I can't even make this up. No, so we go to the, the locksmith. I think he got his uh, license on the back of a matchbook. He couldn't get through the door at all. Finally, he ends up like cutting a hole in the door. <laughs> and we walk through the hole. And now, <laughs> now we're looking for two cats. <laughs> cats that don't want to be found, you're not finding. Right. All right. We're yeah. ripping this apartment behind, <laughs> apart. We're in the closet furs all over us and all. We finally get the cats and uh, send them down to the garage and they're gonna leave. I says, we're not doing this, just you and I. I went back to the rig, got the rest of the guys. Come on, guys. We were there for about six hours. Wow. You know? yeah. One cat died in our hands somehow. And it was crazy. Oh, man. And we finally get, take up, we get back to quarters. I get a call the next day from Von Essen actually telling me what a nice job you guys did, you know. Uh -huh. he kept it out of the newspapers. I said, this is crazy, so. So far. <laughs> so far, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. I don't know what happened to the dead cat in the alley, but uh, you know, that was uh, wow. a squad operation and we took a pounding yeah. from wow. all you guys oh, yeah. when the word got out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as, other than that, you know, really it was at fires. I felt we were, you know, we could have an impact and we did have an impact. We were at some bad, tough days. Atlantic Avenue collapse mm. and all, oh. you know, getting those guys out was, uh, you know, that was all hands on deck for that. And uh, yeah, that's kind one of it. One of the guys that I brought over, he was like in the second wave, was a guy named Greg Haynes. Greg oh, Haynes sure. for, yeah. was from 123, so I knew yeah. him pretty well. And I was trying to get him for a while because he was just a tremendous firefighter, a fabulous teacher, just a great teacher, you know. I used to watch him with the young guys in 123. And we go to a job in South Jamaica. Bread and butter, private dwelling fire, but it's going. Cellar, first floor, attic, the whole thing. We pull up. Jimmy Manahan was the battalion chief in a 5-0 battalion. Joe Curry was the deputy, so we were in quarters with them. And we report in, you know, to the battalion. And he puts us to work, so we split the company up. And there was a report of potentially a kid missing, you know, and this thing is going, man, it's going good. They got lines on all three floors and it, everybody's having a hard time. I wind up in the attic and I'm up in the attic with Jack Kleehouse, he's in 126. And, you know, making some progress and as we're operating, Greg gives a 1045. I remember you got that, right? He gets a 1045. Uh, now I'm bumping the attic, so eventually the fire goes out and everything, we come out, and I talk to Greg and I said, you know, how'd you make out, man? He says, yeah, he says, I found a young girl. It was like a nine-year-old or like a seven-year-old girl. It was a young girl. And he found her in the rear, uh, and she was like uh, in the rear room, uh, and the floor had partially collapsed. He went in the back door. You know, he had to maneuver a little bit, but he was in a really bad spot, you know, and he made the grab, you know, and the girl survived. Mm -hmm. 
So the job's over, and, you know, uh, the news cameras came to the quarters the next day. There was a picture. I, I think it was the Daily News. I think it was the Daily News or the Post, one of them. And Greg was in the picture. I was in the picture. I had a cup of coffee. And I think a few of us had 270 hats on. So a couple of tours later, uh, you know, we, I read Greg up and everything. He winds up getting a medal. He was the first medal in the company. Yeah, I and uh, Von Essen, on, a, on, a, on his notepad, Commissioner of FDNY, he writes a handwritten note to me. Cap, really nice job. I'm proud of you guys. Nice hats that I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so exactly. I had to go get him, bring him a hat. But uh, no, that was uh, that was fairly early on, you know, mm -hmm. in the first year, and uh, it was really cool that Greg got the medal. In fact, he got it. He got an A. He got a class mm -hmm. A, and I'm like an A. I mean, I remember going and looking at the building, you know, to make the drawing and all of that. I'm like an A, man. I said, I can't believe they gave this guy an A, man. This was like a really good grip. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I wasn't one big on appeals, but yeah. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm appealing this thing. So I write the appeal based on the books. You know, you got to have new evidence, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And it gets endorsed all the way through. The next thing I know, the next, the, the, uh, the appeals come down. He goes from an A to a class two. Oh, wow. I'm like, how is that possible? Yeah. Nice. So I said to him, don't get carried Sorry, away, bro. It wasn't a two, but I said, we'll, we'll go with the three. But they gave you a two. Wow. But, he, but he winds up getting the class two. And uh, he didn't get the Gordon Bennett medal, but he got a good medal, you know. He, but, but that was, yeah, right? But it was, uh, that was when I knew kind of like, hey, man, we, we, we did well. You nice. know, yeah. we, we had good guys. And, and the, the fire commissioner wrote a personal handwritten yeah. note, which was pretty cool. Like, you know what I mean? It was cool. Well, I think, you know, I, t I talked to him, uh, I don't remember if it was after 9-11, after the funerals or whatever, but uh, I talked to him once and he, and he said that, might have been in a conference, and, um, and he said that that was the thing, he was, one of the things he was proudest about in his administration, and, you know, I've said this before, I, I think he's right about that, because it just added additional capability Absolutely. to the FDNY mm -hmm. that we didn't have previously. And, you know, it's a lot of motivated people. And, and I think, you know, you look at where it is 25 years later, and it's been a very positive thing. Yeah, you know, overall, 100%. You know. Absolutely. And I think for chiefs, it, gives, it just gives them more, more tools in the yep, toolbox. Absolutely. You know? yep. I was on light duty. Actually, I was on medical leave on 9-11. Uh, following two, a day later, I was, I was put on light duty and then I basically work to um, you know deal with the families you know a liaison with the families I went to a number of the families to mm -hmm. you know break that news which sucked but uh, you know it uh, that's that's what had to be done there was there were no resources there were no resources there was no chaplain to send or oh, how's my husband doing you know or what happened what's the likelihood that he's going to be found you know it was it was all very grim, and we all we all went through it, and we did the best we could with what we had, which wasn't very much. And uh, and then you know after guys were found, we identified them. You know, I mean going down, you know to identify your friends in pieces. You know we had guy we had one of the guys in our company that was found the day of his memorial service, identified by tattoos on his body. We, you know, on the phone between his family and um, and uh, us at the morgue. You know, so it's uh, there was a whole whole laundry list. We all went through it, um, but uh, then you had the additional end of it. After that, was you had to rebuild your company, and like we said earlier, they were going to fold the squads into the rescues. Completely understandable. Um, uh, that was one of my jobs. Was I had. Tom Evans was running the day-to-day -day operation at the, at, at the company. I was still the captain uh, at 288, and Tom did a great job handling the day-in and day-out stuff. Because remember, I mean, we lost, uh, probably lost a third of our, our roster, right? You know, we didn't have a full roster before 9-11. So, uh, so then had to try to recruit. I think I've mentioned this before, but it wasn't that easy to recruit because, like I said, tip of the spear, people do the math. Everybody's got the mindset we're going to get hit again. You know, guys would say, yes, I'll come over. And 24 hours later, they'd call back and go, talk to my wife. I can't do it. You know, so I, and I think we all went through that, you know. And we had meetings, right? We had, we had meetings right after that. And, 
You know, everybody, the whole thing was in flux. You know, his office is missing. They were, you know, all, the, the command had basically been, you know, not to use that word, but decapitated. All of our senior leadership was gone. You know, the guys that we counted on, the guys that we were just talking about, the chiefs that we lost that day, just irreplaceable, the guys that we lost that day. Uh, the guy, you know, our, our firefighters and our officers, just, you know, uh, you talk about nobody could be prepared for handling that kind of loss. We certainly weren't, but... You know, we're ordinary men in an extraordinary situation. We did the best we could. And, you know, I think later on, I think uh, if you look back at it in hindsight, we did okay getting everybody up and running. Uh, the guys really, really stepped up. Working those charts after 9-11, that was brutal. Mm -hmm. And you think, you think about, you know, you guys were down at the site. Uh, I wound up down there eventually going down there at night. It, it was it was tough, you know. It was very very difficult for every. You know, we tend to compartmentalize it, put it over here, you know, and that's how we deal with it, you know. Uh, but very difficult, very difficult emotionally, very di difficult physically for guys, you know. Um, you know, I've got friends that are mentally ill today because of what they experienced down there that they can't even function. You know, you don't hear about any of this. But at least we're trying to take care of our own, you know. And and all the guys that we've lost since then. Is a whole other story, you know. But it's uh, so that was my experience after something. You were, we were asking people to do something that was almost <laughs> beyond human capability, you know. Just that, you know. Go to a funeral, go work, do manual labor for f for 15 hours. Go to a funeral, do manual labor for 15. So, going to the companies, every company was different. Everybody, some companies were trying to be the big tough guys, you know, and all of that. But uh, to Dennis's point. You know, all the cheat. Like, that's why I was there. You know, Charlie Casper, John Paolillo, yeah. John Moran. They all got killed. Yeah. And uh, they, they they had to backfill, and we did what we we did the best we could as well, yeah. trying to fill in the gaps during that period of time. But uh, you all, you guys, did like just tremendous work. You know, oh. rebuilding your units. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, I was out of there. I got promoted right after 9/11. You got promoted in that group, right? Mm. Right. Backdated to the tent, yeah. Yeah. you know. Right. Um, he winds up basically replacing me at the site. At the site, right. you know. Yeah, I remember after seeing you there months. one night. Yeah. I, to, I was and supposed uh, to go down there. I went yeah. down at night. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I remember Conway was there all yeah. the time. Where yeah. were you yeah. after, yeah. after that? Where were you working? I got when I first got made. I went to the three eight, but it hardly worked there, and then got lifted into the four nine. Okay. What we needed to do in two fifty two is uh, we lost Timmy Higgins, and he was probably going to keep the spot there. So, uh, and uh, Eddie Metcalf had gotten promoted prior to that, so he was, uh, you know, and uh, bouncing around. So now I get promoted, we needed a captain, so they were able to bring Eddie Metcalf back. So the guys were familiar with Eddie, yeah. and that, that was a great fit. Uh, and uh, Bobby Chisano got promoted on the same day I did, out of 252, so we needed a lieutenant. He came and filled that spot. So the families knew these guys. It, that was a home run that for big, 252. Yeah. That was a big and thing. Because I was running around, you know, visiting the, you know, the families and being down there, but these guys stepped right up, and uh, the company really uh, came together. And, th and then Eddie brought in some really top-quality guys, you know, that were willing to step into this, uh, as yeah. you say. You know, we're at the spear of it. And uh, he, he filled, backfilled the company, and uh, we went on. The one thing that was 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 made you proud to be uh, on the job, no less, but in particularly in Special Operations Command, once the companies got some staffing and they got people in the companies, you know, we had people working down at the pile, but the rescues and the squads, man, they were going about, they were going yeah. fires, doing, yeah. their, yeah. doing, doing their thing, yeah. just like all the other companies in the city. Right. right. Everybody was responding. We yeah. never stopped. We never took a day off. We nope. never stopped responding. Every run got answered in the city of New York, right? Uh, we didn't miss a run. Like, right. right? We had, yeah. we had some volunteer departments initially backfilling the firehouses, but, yeah. right? You think about that. Think about the gravity of that order. Yeah. Like, that we never missed a run. Like yep. We were continuing to respond. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys in the SOC companies, as enthusiastic as ever, going to jobs, doing their, doing their job. Like, and so yeah. that was uh, quite Yeah, heads and weren't down for too long company. as far as that That's went. Right. Uh, right. That's right. But I, you know, I look at it back on the, um, the, what we had to deal with during you know, that time, especially when the funerals mm. were running. And you know, 
I always felt bad because I felt that um, we were unable to, to do for a, uh, uh, for our guys at that time, all of them, what we normally do for a line of, New, line of duty death in oh, the yeah. New York City Fire Department. You know, somebody said, I saw it on, on Facebook, I think, a year or two years ago, maybe for the anniversary, the 20th anniversary. Somebody, thank God, had saved one of the newspaper uh, articles mm -hmm. and, uh, for one of the days, and I think it was in October. 14 listing the few remember they were doing that for a while mm -hmm. listing all the funerals right. 14 funerals in one day we had a day where we had two funerals in our firehouse simultaneously one of the guys lived upstate one of the guys was on long island think about the decision you have to make there i can go to one but i can't be in two no one of us can be in two places at once really really tough and i always felt that way i was talking to chief carruthers about that once and you know he was like thanks for everything you're doing we know we know it's very di i said yeah it's just there's it's not that there's no support it's just that the support that we normally yeah. have to deal with this is not enough these guys can't the band can only supply so many right. guys uh ceremonial unit only has so many guys mm -hmm. there's only so much that we can physically do and when you're burying 14 guys in one day you know that's just exceeding it by a wild more by a wide margin you know so it's you know i always felt bad about that because I, I don't think our guys got what they should have gotten there due. you know i know there's people now that say oh you know you guys are like a culture of death and things like that and it's that's all horse shit. you know right. i think it's just the opposite of that we we, we honor our people amen uh, just sometimes we get criticized for that not too often but occasionally and i don't i don't i don't agree with that analysis i think most guys realize it's a very positive thing it's uh you know it's because we care and i think we look at each other as a family and mm -hmm. that's one of the best things about the new york city fire department is that you're included in that culture of family and we try to take care of each other and you know i would say that we do better than ever taking care of our families. Oh, I, I, was at a, I was at a World Trade Center funeral today. And I, I, I was standing next to Tommy Galvin. And we were standing there and I just look and I see what our ceremonial unit yep. does mm -hmm. for our families. Uh, what the company, the affected company does for the family. And everyone I've gone to, you know, these guys... Billy Hughes was number 300. Yeah. And we have two more to go. Uh, one more. Uh, actually, well, there's one. There's two more, actually. Joe McKee and then another firefighter, young kid from 308 engine. I think his funeral is tomorrow as well. But I think we do better than ever. And, of course, we learn from that, right? Oh, but, yeah, yeah. But to your point, like we, the fire department, the job takes care of its people. They Absolutely. really do. You know, is that uh, firefighter from 123? Yes. Bill Hughes. Yeah, he you know, uh, he was in a little side story, 123. Tom Galvin was a firefighter there. Vinnie Fowler was a firefighter there. Uh, Tom is a captain of uh, Fort Truck. Vinnie Fowler gets promoted. He comes and bounces as a lieutenant in uh, the 3rd Division. And he... Uh, I'm trying to think of the firefighter that uh, died in quarters at 123. Came back after a job. Mm -hmm. uh, they had Gene a couple Cummings? of jobs at the roof. Is it Cummings. Actually, Cummings? He died. He died like on a roof. Yes, he was, he died uh, on the roof. Uh, Not Gene. Oh, goodness, no. Big. Is it my probably close? Big, big guy. Yep. Yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> Vinny took it upon himself to say, you know, what does a company do when they have a line of duty funeral of one of their own? And Vinny got involved uh, heavily because he was a stand-up guy in that company. Mm -hmm. um, covering there once, they had a three-ring binder of all target houses in the neighborhood. And there was pictures of the building and all information about it. It was Vinny Fowler that put the book together. It wasn't yep. the offices. Vinny put it together. And so that's the kind of guy he was. But he gets promoted uh, to captain out of Midtown. Uh, he wound up being... Uh, an officer in the uh, seven truck. Uh, he goes to headquarters, and you, you know what they gave him and what he took on as an assignment? Was writing up the protocols for line a of line of deaths. duty death. That's right. And he sent me the draft, and I have it at home. And he signed it. Here, go read this over, blah, blah, blah. And a short time later, he'd be killed in a two by four shoebox in Queens. Yep. Yeah. You know? you know, when 270 responded to that, I was the captain still. And the guys, 
they took it really hard wow. at that job because we had trained so hard mm-hmm. on firefighter yeah. rescue, right? Yeah. And it was just such stuff. a difficult fire. You know, Jimmy Earl winds up in the hospital, right. and almost he died himself. He was almost killed. Yeah. And uh, Tony Tedeschi and a few of the other guys, they they took it really, really hard, man. And uh, you know, I was proud of all of them. You know that they were able to get through that, but they took it pretty hard. And uh, you're right, it was a little, little nothing, one story freaking private <laughs> dwelling with a cellar. But they come out with the. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't know. matter, right? You know, reports, uh, the job. You know, fatal fire reports. Blah blah blah. Uh, and sometimes they really miss the point of uh, certain things that happen, and it, it's missed. And I'll give you for instance at the Vinny Fowler job. The basement was split in half, meaning right. there was a wall right down the center of the basement. As soon as you come down, and the stairwell was only like 23 yeah, inches yeah, wide, yeah, really w- was made the difficulty really uh, getting Vinny out. But as soon as you came down the stairs, you were in a room that was almost like a living room. It had a bar, then it had another room like with a kitchen, and then there was a washer, dryer past that. But this wall, you had to, from this like living room area, you step in, uh, through a door into a bedroom, and then you go through on that side of the wall, through another door into another bedroom, and then through another door into the workshop where the fire started. Vinny comes down the stairs. He's on this side of the wall where the living room is and the bar and this and that. And he sees fire. Yeah, but you know what he was seeing? Fire communicating across from the other side of the wall. I'm bringing this up because there's an OV outside the building. And the fire out of that bedroom, excuse me, basement window back there was so intense, it incinerated a bush right outside the window. I'm bringing this up because even though the officers I found the fire, the OV should say, uh, by the way, I have fire blowing out a window in uh, uh, two uh, or the three, four corner, because Vinny would have said, fire blowing out a window? Oh shit. I haven't found the fire. You hear what I'm saying? So things are missed. Yeah. Just like the Father's Day fire. Mm-hmm. That was not a backdraft, that was a smoke explosion. And all we had to do was introduce water. While they were having difficulty forcing that door, just give it a squirt and take the energy out of the fuel, the fuel being the smoke. These are just things that we have still yet to learn. The job is, it, it's progressed so much. We have Chief Lee, we had yourself. Mm-hmm. such progressive chiefs that have brought the FDNY up to, we are the leaders in the industry on the planet. Internationally, they're looking at FDNY as to what they're doing, uh, the training division, and even looking at our policies and procedures because there's departments. Melbourne, Australia right now happens to be a city exploding with high rise. Would you believe just this year they adopted, they call it a doctrine, an SOP for high rise? Wow. Just this year? Yeah. Wow. So we're so far ahead of the curve. We have drones, we have robots to say, you know, somebody would laugh, but no. That gives an incident commander a view in a collapse. Uh, yeah, I'm so proud of the job uh, to say where they're going. We're taking the lead on the lithium ion battery issue right now. Yeah. Amen. Just had a big symposium at The Rock, two days. Like that. Yeah, and, that's uh, going nowhere. I mean, it's gonna get you know, worse and worse. Oh, and worse. absolutely. That's, where, that's yeah. where the technology is going. And, yeah. uh, you know, they want to put one of these things in everybody's home yeah. is the eventual right. plan, yeah. you know. Yeah, and that's another thing. They'll take uh, decommissioned batteries out of cars and they'll put them next to a private dwelling, so the solar yeah, system, right. but yet it'll be attached to a wall of a private dwelling. Right. It should be detached. Right. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah, I think we're going down the right road right now, actually. Uh, continue what they're doing, but yes, I do check up on the squad. You know, I keep in touch with, with a lot of the guys, the former members are now retired. The, you know, the job is turned over. This is 24 years ago that squad was formed as all our squads were formed. There's nobody there now who was there, you know, prior to 9-11. But uh, yeah, we, we keep in touch and uh, they're working hard. They're getting great officers in there. They're like pumped. They really are pumped up, you know. I'm proud of them. And that's, uh, that they're going to continue doing what, what we've been doing all along, you know. Yeah, I speak to them often. I know, I know many of the guys that are there. I go there. 
uh, even since I retired, I, I, I go once in a while for lunch. I was so proud of them this year. Firefighter in 270 got the top medal in the job this year for mm -hmm. uh, rescuing a brother in a collapse in a fire in Queens. Uh, it was, uh, you know, unbelievable, right? Uh, yeah. Great young man. And when I do go there, I feel like I almost never left. I just mm -hmm. see, you know, you feel the enthusiasm yeah. and they're all in. It, and that's, that's the culture, you know, that's in special operations and it's continued in special operations. So I think we're, we're very, very blessed that we were able to start that ball or start it going, right? Amen. And it's, yeah. it's just continued, man, because mm -hmm. that's the fire department. And that's the same in, in any, any great unit, like engine, truck, whatever company it is. I, I'll tell you the truth. When I was working as chief of department, and even when, it, oh, actually from the time I was a deputy, I took a real special operations command. Who would think, think about the Marine Division when we were young firefighters. Yeah. The Marine Division is unbelievable. The capability yeah. and the enthusiasm and how much work they do in the summer when they do that summer boat mm -hmm. program. So the, the point I'm making is that yes, I follow up on the company, but what I see in the department, you know, having just left, you know, uh, eight or nine months ago is that this department, this job will always be fine. We continue to attract good people, and we will continue to attract good people, despite all of the, the hopla sometimes about this and that. We got great people on this job, and it'll always be like that. I really do believe that in my heart of hearts, and particularly the special operations companies. Yeah. You know, you're always going to attract good talent. And uh, those, the, the guy, when I go to the firehouse, I'm, I'm just elated when I sit down and talk with them because they're awesome. They, they love the job, and they'll continue to do great work. I stay in touch. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the members just asked me, he wants me to come by and uh, share a little wisdom on High Rise. Uh, I have a book about to be published. It was supposed to be published last spring. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can buy it at IKEA right now for some assembly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's a book about high rise. Uh, and I like to share stuff like that because, as uh, when we said in the beginning, you know, uh, these firefighters are they high rise savvy? And there's a thing about high rise, to tell you the truth. You know, there was things that I used to do uh, only because experience would tell you. If I walked in a lobby door, and often enough you have a choice of flat door or the revolving door. And the reason that revolving door is there is to keep the pressures in the building. You open up one of those flat doors, you're either going to get hit with a blast of air in your face or it's going to be at your back, and that's either a positive stack or a negative stack in a building. And if I came through a, a revolving door, uh, I went over to the elevator shaft, waiting for an elevator, and I would feel the draft in the elevator. Not so much the piston effect of the elevator moving, but it would give me the draft in the building. Because sometimes you're there chasing smoke. So where's it coming from? Is it coming from the upper floor? Is it coming from below? Uh, all of these things. And these are just things, they're not written in books. You know? Uh, voids, where's smoke gonna go? I have a, one of my pet things, and I wouldn't call it a pet, pet peeve, if you will. More people die of smoke than they do of fire in high-rise buildings, whether they be residential, mixed-use, office buildings, blah, blah, blah. Who's responsible for smoke movement and control in a high-rise building? The chief. And I just had a chief the other day who is high-rise savvy, and he says he's reluctant to turn on an HVAC system even when the fire's under control. He wants a building engineer doing it. And granted, we're not engineers, but if we don't understand the systems, because it could be three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and I'm dealing with the B team and not the A team, the building engineer. It's a guy who works at part-time. I have to know the system. I gotta know what I want to do with these buildings. To think about the challenge Frank Lieb had with the Bronx tragedy. Now that was open doors and things like that, and we're gonna get that again. Uh, you know what? The ventilation support group was put to work rescuing people and not pressurizing those stairs. And that's something that we got to do. When you pressurize stairs to keep them smoke free, it's for firefighters and civilians. 
and it was because of the research that we did with fans that it was introduced into the job. And there's still chiefs that are reluctant to, they don't even call, is ventilation support here? We're going to charge you. So there's still work to do. And, you know, if I could embed some of this information into a squad, a squad officer could say, you know, chief, uh, we could do this, we could do that. Because as special operations companies arrive, they are counsels to the incident command. They're not the guys that should be taking over hand lines and things like that. And they're filling in the gaps and making an impact. Uh, but the officers have really have to be a counsel to the incident command. Yeah, that's my beef. Yeah. Oh, just, uh, yeah, staying in touch. Yeah, we were just in for the uh, anniversary of 9-11. You know, go there every year just about. And um, had lunch with uh, a few guys from the squad last week. And... Uh, yeah, we stay in touch. You know, occasionally I need a T-shirt. You know? <laughs> uh, but no, it's a, you know what has been mentioned before. Uh, being um, starting something, you kind of look at it as your own a little bit. And uh, I'm very happy with what I see going on in 288. But uh, you know, globally, the whole department. You know, you look at the. You guys opened a new squad in Staten Island last year or two years ago, and uh, you know it's it's great because it's it's just more capability, more resources for the incident commanders to use, uh, more capability on the scene, uh, and you know a lot of times it's not going to be needed, but there are going to be times where we've all seen it. You're going to be an impact company. You're going to make a big difference because you're in the right place at the right time. You know. I think when we started the squads too, I think what happened as well. It raised it raised the game in the surrounding units. That's right. Yeah. Did it not? Yeah. Absolutely. It makes everybody better. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely. It makes everybody better. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And it did. Put the I agree. Hundred percent. We were we were like pretty much good companies, but I think because yeah. I think we brought that enthusiasm everybody's and that mindset. Everybody's getting off the rig dressed. Right? Everybody's I, I got think it raised the bar. Right. It raised the bar. I really believe it did. Yeah. Before the squads, uh, operating 111 and 102, I used to say to myself, how did 102 get this portable into the rear of this brownstone? It brought everybody's game yeah. up. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. all these trucks. The First Responder Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. Today's old school health and safety tip of the day is, after a fire, shower as soon as possible and before cleaning tools. Firefighters have a higher rate of cancer. Tool and equipment will never have cancer, but a firefighter might In closing, reduce your risk. The squads have been a vital part can. of the New York City Fire Department for over a century. They have come and gone in many forms and many apparatus types, but one thing always remained the same. They went to a massive amount of fires and were used to fill in the gaps and make an impact in a positive way. Today's squads are more sophisticated and better equipped than their predecessors but still are used by the incident commanders to do the jobs that need to be done. Whether it's engine ops, truck work, auto extrication, high angle rescue, or any other technical rescue, the squad is like a Swiss army knife. They operate with precision, professionalism, heart, and determination to complete whatever task they have been given. They are a small group of people or soldiers having a particular task or set of tasks and they just get the job done.